The following program is brought to you with limited commercial interruption. Today's broadcast is being simulcast in broken English. Welcome to the show that we're doing right now. What the hell are we doing on this show? Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. It jumped up a notch. It did, didn't it? Let's go. What is this? Who else but the Q? It's showtime. Gentlemen, gentlemen, let's get down to business. Can you dig it? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Q. You're listening to the best pop culture, current events, current affairs show, east or west of that Mississippi River, hailing from the great city of St. Louis and worldwide at theqnow.com. I am your host, Mark Bland, and this is one hell of an episode. First off, I am joined today by two wonderful gentlemen. One is named Jason Call. What's up, Jason Call? Hey, how are you? And one is named Mike Eyes. What's up, Mike Eyes? What's up? Is it Ice or Eyes? Eyes, like Eisenhower. I, like Eisenhower. Got it. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. I just was always curious. I've always said my guys, but like at the same point, it could be ice. Mm-hmm. You can be ice. At one point, they called me liquid ice in pro wrestling, which just means water. <laughs> but I was cool with that because it was kind of a cool <laughs> liquid ice. Like I was like, oh yeah, man, I can get into anything. Yeah, they yeah. called me Ice Man in football. So. They called you the Ice Man in football. Yeah, there you go. Yep. Now I noticed that this time around, you don't have a heathen's hat on. This nope. time around, you're rocking the state of California, the great uh, state of Cali and the Bear. Yeah, I guess that's a Colorado hat, actually. It's Could be. Colorado. Could be a Colorado thing. There you go. Okay. Yeah, I got to see there for the Colorado. I understand yeah. it. Fair enough. You're still a heathen, whether you like it or not. We're yeah. just going to continue to call you a heathen. It is a religious, as we learned from Mike the last time, yeah. it is a religious style group of yeah. individuals. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, a a, it's a form of religion, yes. Yeah. Is that a current religion? Would you say it's current? Absolutely. What do you it think, is current? What do you think Thursday is named after Thor? What do you think Friday is named after Freya? Hmm. Wednesday's named after Woden, which is Odin. What? Uh, Those wait, are Friday's named after what? Freya, which is Freya? a woman uh, god who's one of the more powerful. Well, gods ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm glad that you said the name Freya because we have a guest on this episode of the Q. And I will tell you this this individual is in the current limelight of the world in pop culture. There is a movie on NBC about him currently called The Thing About Pam. His name is Russ Faria. He's going to be sitting down on this episode of The Q just in a little bit with myself. We're going to talk about the Pam Hupp case and everything that went around it. And uh, that all happened out in St. Charles County, Lincoln County, up towards Troy, uh, about 30 minutes outside of St. Louis where we live. And actually relatively close to where we all live. Yeah, it wasn't like, too far away. Uh, and so, like, Russ Faria is going to join us and talk to us about that. But until we get to Russ Faria, we've got the rest of the world going on, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm glad that you are all here to talk with us about this because we are in a situation currently, and it is now getting murkier. And I'll say this because uh, earlier this week, Zelensky, the president of uh, Ukraine, got on with Congress and Senate and everybody on a video call. And he basically said to the president and everybody else, we need your help. Yeah. Like you guys remember 9-11, you guys remember the Iraqi war, you remember, you know, all these different things. Well, guess what? We are dealing with a similar terroristic issue right now. Uh, Putin is like, like everybody said, Putin is definitely not got the military running at the levels that we all thought that the Russian military was, That's but true. he still got more numbers and power and machinery than Zelensky and the Ukrainians have. And so even if he doesn't have the strongest army, he's got the one that can withstand the length of time and you give it enough time, they'll get everywhere they need. Yeah. They'll take over Kiev. They'll take over everything else. And then they'll just take over the Ukraine and it's over with. And that's exactly what Putin wanted to do. Now, Zelensky asking us puts us in a situation because Poland stated that they were willing to give up some of their fighter jets in exchange to, or not exchange, but to help the Ukrainians out. Mm -hmm. And they were going to give them to the United States to exchange and give them to the Ukrainians. But the United States told Poland, no way, we don't want the fighter jets because by doing this, it looks like we're allying the situation and we could get dragged into World War III. But I think, guys, that we're in the same position now. 
I really do because here's the thing. When they come directly to the biggest dog on the block and go, we need your help, and you've had the Cold War with Russia, you understand Russia, you understand Putin, you understand being the big dog on the block with the military weaponry, like, we need your help. Now, at that point, it's not about telling Poland no. Now you're looking at the guy directly who's running the country and dealing, who's literally had multiple assassination attempts on his life. Yeah. You're looking at him in the face and going, yes or no? Well, we haven't said yes. We said that we were going to send them some money. We said that we were going to try to help them out with some sanctions and some different things like that, but we have not jumped in. Now, here's the problem. If they all get killed and he takes over Ukraine, everyone's going to look at the United States and go, you could have stopped that. You could have been the one that stopped it. He asked you early enough. You could have gotten people over there, warships and all that, and you could have taken out all this business. If he says no like he did, or if he says yes, then we just get immediately drug into World War III, basically, because we know what's going to happen. Russia's huge. We're huge. We're going to make moves. They're going to make moves. It's not going to be like uh, 1776 guys and bayonets and, you know, 2,000 troops on a farm field fighting each other. This is going to be legitimately like hardcore warfare. Like there's going to be nuclear warheads and uh, mis- cruise missiles, ISIS missiles, so any- anything that Putin can get his hands on, he's going to be firing. And we've got our drones and all the stuff that we've talked about on the show before. So my question here, and I'm glad that I have Mr. Eyes as well as Mr. Call on the show, because first off, Mike. What do you think we should do? Do you think Biden's think move should. was the right move, or do you think we should switch up? I think we should, uh, number one, uh, the sanctions that we have going right now with the— uh, with with especially with these companies not doing any business with Russia and all this, it's making a big effect. I thought that was baloney at first. The you thought it wasn't going to do much. I'm like, you know, baloney. Let's get let's fight these guys. Is where I was at with the whole thing. But really, uh, the economic impact of all this is huge on Russia right now, and they, you know, they're paying they're paying their bills with Bitcoin right now. It's so bad. Mm-hmm. But with that being said, uh, what do I think we should do? I think we should play the game that they always play on us and we play on them every freaking time and that's every time like whenever we tried to take out the taliban guess what they did they fed them weapons right under the carpet that people couldn't track or didn't know about but they came from the russians and okay. meanwhile they fought okay. us I see what we should saying. just do the same thing and say no we're not giving them any weapons we don't know what you're talking <laughs> about and meanwhile we're giving them weapons because that is the game that the russians play on us so, so you want to fight fair. fire with a little fire. We'll do the same. And under the rug, we'll give them weapons and we'll say, no, we're not giving them weapons. We don't know what you're talking about. Never, never gave them any weapons. Meanwhile, we are. That's that's the game they play. Okay. And we'll run them out of money and run them out of military. Jason you know? Cole, what do you think? I think that's the way to go. I mean, you can't start a war with Russia. Like, you can't just in, involve yourself militarily like that. But I don't understand the difference between sending them planes through Poland and these javelins and these other missile systems right. that we're sending. I mean, that's... They're part of the UN. It's they should defensive, be able to give but in to the them. end, it's an offensive weapon because when the plane flies over, whoosh, there goes the missile. Now, I will down. say this, guys. I will say this. The UN is sitting there. We have multiple countries within striking range of Ukraine and Russia currently that are a part of our little groupings. Uh, if we all feel, as the UN or NATO or whatever, that there is bad stuff going on because Vladimir Putin, I feel like Poland and some of those countries could be like, yo, we're willing to come to the fight right now, but yeah. they're afraid because their border's right there, and then right. they know the minute that they make the move, this could end up hitting, because you got Belarus, you got all these other countries that are sided up with Putin. Well, when everything cools down, assuming it will, uh, they're thinking, now we're going to be enemies with our neighbor here that we already have a, a tight relationship with, you know, that are kind of ten- a tense relationship, let's say. Well, especially if he's able to topple the government in, in Ukraine, so as long as he does get Oh, yeah, then he's got even more power because he gets their resources. Then he'll put some, you know, puppet regime in, and now oh, Poland yeah. is bordered not only... With the Ukraine, but yep. now Russia on the other side, and that's that's. And a meanwhile, tough spot. Poland Poland falls into that same genre of X mm-hmm. used to be you know part of Russia type of deal. They're not uh, they're not too keen on guys moving through Europe taking over countries. So no, it's got bad taste. Well, in this you know this also comes on the heels of John Bolton. John Bolton came out of nowhere and said, "Hey, I'm just going to be honest with you guys. Putin saw Trump doing a majority." of this stuff 
already for yeah. him. This is why he decided not to invade the Ukraine, because Trump was basically setting all these things in motion for him. He didn't have to do anything. Now that it's on him, because Trump's gone, he doesn't have that power. We're just going to ride with it, guys. Like, that's that's how this is going to go down. And Bolton, he was there. He was right hand yeah. in, handling these things, talking to Trump, dealing with all these things. You know, and... And is anyone else frustrated by people like Bolton or Bolton Bolton a by Bolton? Bit. I mean, he screwed around during the impeachment and wouldn't testify. Now yeah. he wants to just profit off his personal knowledge of how he screwed, how screwed up Trump was as a person. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing with thanks a lot, John Bolton, you fool. Like I don't. Also, well, same thing with Bill Barr. That book came out like Tuesday, and it talks about. How the uh, the election stuff had no no basis, no ground. Did we talk reality. about on the last show that uh, Barr said that if 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 Trump ran again, yeah, he was still it. down to be yeah. on his team even and vote though, for him? Yeah, even though he, even though he, he said, disagreed with everything the man and, said, and said he is unfit, should never run again. It, it, that's terrible because that's all it's about. Then is just winning. It's it's not about it's not. And you literally, 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 what literally, you're literally, saying the this words is coming out of your what mouth. What I've been saying about conservatives for the longest of time, ladies and gentlemen. It was never about policy. It was never about politics. Yeah. It was about being a discernible a hole for no reason whatsoever to every person you could find that was willing to deal with you being an a-hole to them. Then getting away with it because you could point to social media and to everybody else and go, see, they're doing it. See, <laughs> see, I'm just a jerk because I can get away with it. And it's like, they still do this. But they think that it's about politics. They try to sit there and say that their natural way of who they are as people is a political decision. And it's like, nope, nope, has nothing to do with politics. No. You just want to be a jerk. And you want to get away with it. Like, that's all it ever came down to. And remember, hashtag winning, 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 or winning. Win like you said, it was always about winning, Mike. It was right. always about just throwing things in other people's Whatever faces to get away with it. Well, for you. And, and I, well, I'll take Bill Barr, since it's newer. Everything in his book would have really come in handy, say, December 2020. If he would have come out as attorney general right. and said, this is all Maybe. Crap. I mean, <laughs> half of the people that support Trump, and literally, he could shoot somebody in the street and that they don't true. really care. Well, we talked I mean, about it. You uh, can, there is so much that has come out against Trump. And there are people like, I can't wait yeah. to get Trump back in there. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm, I'm we, just like, well, this, we, is, this is like really Hitler-esque. It really is because Hitler <laughs> had a got, similar thing where he ran into trouble at the beginning of his whole career and then it, people were calling him out similarly oh, and then five years or so down the line, next thing you know, he's the Fuhrer and freaking people the last are following time, him. The last time we were all together, we talked about how in order to support him, you have to believe so many people are lying. That list is yeah. so long. Everybody's lying like, but him. Everybody. You Everybody's know? lying but I'll, him. I'll give you a moment. Say three or four people come up with something about you and they make up a lie. Yeah. That is something that obviously happens. Right. Not 700. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> you know? I want to read something to both of you gentlemen before we get to our first break. And the thing that I want to read to you is from a username, Plastivore2020, okay? But... He wrote this, and it's an interesting thing, and I want you guys to hear this. This war is a tough spot for the U.S. On one hand, Zelensky is right about everything. On the other hand, direct engagement or perceived direct engagement of Russia by NATO can go really bad really fast. I think the approach Biden has taken is an approach of letting Ukraine turn into Putin's very own Vietnam to such a degree that he's taken down from inside of Russia. By all the indications, this war is extremely unpopular inside of Russia at a time when Putin thought it would be an easy win to boost his credibility in the next rigged election that they're going to put out. He now is likely to be a pariah, uh, not a good place to be if you have an Ill illegitimate claim to power. By NATO, U.S. not engaging directly, it's much harder for him to paint the West as the bad guys and because there are so many social ties between Russia and the Ukrainians, he can't really suppress the truth of what is happening. In other words, this type of support NATO is providing probably keeps escalation down while also making the war extremely costly for Putin, unfortunately, at the expense of lives of the people of the Ukraine. And I think that that gentleman is right. Like yeah. the, the way he eloquently laid that out. I think that's exactly where we're at, everybody. I think that this is a situation where... Biden and them maybe start feeding things behind the scenes, like you said, Mike. 
trying well, to just to keep their name out of the paper. Crazy. But you want to keep your name out of the tabloids on right. the on the top side. You know what I'm saying? Feed down here, but let that become his personal Vietnam. Let it all go sideways. Right. Let him lose a ton of troops to 500 yeah. groups yep. when he's got 6,000 troops and 500 people fighting him, and he loses 3,500 of them well, for, to 500 what, people. That's like, what happened to Russia whenever they went to Afghanistan first also. Yeah. Yeah. They got drained. I mean, they drained the resources. Let's just do the same thing. But like you said, though, the bad part is people are being killed. However, whenever Russia makes that choice to invade a country— People are going to be killed. I mean, they've yeah. made the choice that people are going to, innocent people are going to be killed here. I mean, it's going to Maybe happen. we should just carpet bomb. Maybe right. we should just carpet bomb Russia. Like, the thing like, about it, why they, not? they've right. shown that they have a powerful military. I, Let's honestly, be honest. What if, what if we just went in, like I said, with supersonic drones and just laid waste to Moscow as a city as a whole and just step back and been like, there you go. There's your home. Now it's in rubble, just like the Ukraine. Deal with it. What are you going to do? Go ahead. Get, get everything riled up while your communication systems are completely destroyed. All of your people are starving and they're angry at you. Like, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a quick break here on the queue. We got the Russ Faria interview coming up in just a little bit, but we'll be back here on News Radio 105.3, 1280 AM, KYRO, in just a few seconds. Welcome back to 105.3 FM, 1280 AM, KYRO, News Radio, 105.3 FM, KYRO. Uh, Mark Bland, The Q, Mike Eyes, Jason Call sitting here. We've been talking a little bit about this uh, Zelensky, Ukrainian, Russian situation and how he asked for the United States' help. And we've kind of agreed that there should be help of some sort. We're not sure how it should go. But, you know, Mike's idea of maybe, you know, a little backdoor pedaling might not be a bad idea. Idea in this situation, yeah, that could be a good idea. Um, what else is going on in the world with you guys, huh? What is going on with you guys? Because uh, I got an interesting interview coming up. I'm getting ready to talk to Russ Faria. What do you guys know about this this case? This this Pam Hup, the uh, the thing about Pam, the stuff that's on NBC right now. Yeah, what do you guys about know it. about this? Pure evil. Right, I just this started, is some crazy stuff, right? I just, I just made it through episode one of the thing about Pam. So I'm, okay, I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm not. And know. what's your impression of the TV show so far? Like what, the first uh, episode odd. that you've it's seen. It's an odd. Um, you know, it's it's the, the way they tell the together. story. Yeah, like the way the, they tell the it. The narrator yeah. talking, and then oh yeah, Keith oh, Morris said, "Oh, oh yeah. it's, it's Christmas morning yeah. in 19 yeah. or 2011. <laughs> it's a little town named yeah. nobody knows who it is. Yeah, <laughs> Troy, Missouri. What is why this? Why do they have a narrator for? Uh, they do. Because you got Keith Morris in. Like you get like that Doctor Seuss. No, you get the guy who's famous from Deadline. Yeah, the real Deadline guy. Like weird to have a narrator. Something like a. Could you? Like Christmas Christmas movie. Movie. I, I feel personally, make it I feel personally like it should be Chris Hansen. It should be like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Pam, come over here and sit down. Why do you got a bag of Mike's Hard Lemonade? <laughs> yeah. Is this you, Pokey Butt eighty nine on uh, on Insta Twitters? Is this you stabs Is this a you? lot? Stabs. <laughs> Is you stabs a lot. <laughs> Is it, dude, I just Mr. Meat Stick. Yeah. But you know, uh, the one thing that I want to bring up to Russ when I talk to him. Is that uh, to me when I watched all this, like, and I did some serious research for this. Like, I, lo- I watched some of these crime watches. I watched some of the uh, the, the the daily the daily news broadcasts where yeah. they, you know, they just pieced together things where they were talking about it. I also watched, obviously, the first episode of of the thing about Pam. And I, I lived in Troy whenever this happened. Whenever all this went down, you lived way out there. Yep. And I also, you know, what's funny is the judge that's now that got, uh, you know, I guess stripped of her. Well, oh, whatever. the prosecutor? She, no, the, the judge. Oh, the judge. Uh, actually, uh, I uh, handed out pamphlets and walked in parades and stuff for her to get her, because uh, she was my uh, landlord of, I had a business out there at the time, and she was the landlord of the business, asked me to walk in the parade and stuff with them, my kids did and everything, for her. It was uh, Chris. Uh, Look how she Well, what's yeah. crazy about this is this story is on the same level as 
Netflix's Tiger King. It's on the same level as the Jean Benet Ramsey situation. It's right. on the OJ level. Like this is something that has become bigger than just a typical one hour crime watch right. uh-huh. like episode throughout what other many seasons. Like this has become right. five, four, five. What I can, I'll ask Russ, but like multiple Dateline episodes oh, yeah. about this because he goes to jail, gets out of jail, then they catch her again on a different. Like there's multiple episodes. Like it is just. Craziness, but I've said on this show so many times. Missourians are the ones who are a red state. They're the ones who love the Josh Hollies with their <laughs> fist held high, being ignorant right. jerks who'll say and do anything and just lie through their teeth. Right. They love this stuff. And I'm not knocking my state. I love Missouri. I love my state. But the people, the people <laughs> of this state, I'm sorry, all of y'all. Some of you guys are wild. Well, the bandwagoners, Out of the crazy. for sure. Bandwagon. And listen, listen, if Trump's got 80 million voters... And most of St. Louis lives in the rules around it. Like, it's not downtown and the 500,000 down there. It's the two and a half million outside of downtown. And I would say every bit of 70 to 80 percent of those people are probably relatively decent conservatives, staunch conservatives, or hardcore well, Trump supporters and conservatives of that level. Like, this is... Um, St. Charles. This, this is the, sure, St. Charles yeah. in the area we're talking about, out yeah, there towards Troy. Sure, those guys are all Trump supporters. They made this mistake at the polls in 2016. They made it again in 2020. They're the ones who think convoys from Canada are going to change American politics. Like, they're the ones who think QAnon yeah. is something that you should care about. It's, I, it's craziness. I would be the only two counties that Trump lost in Missouri would probably be St. Louis County or whatever county most of Kansas City is covered by. Right. That and would be the two. Everyone else, they probably, even even Columbia, which normally college towns, conservatives lose, but even Columbia, he probably won well, whatever county and, they're under. Maybe. And like I said. Yeah, you can look it up. Yeah, but. right. <laughs> and like I said, this sums up a lot of Missourians for the most part. Uh yeah, I believe in, I'm so, I have such strong beliefs in my politics, blah, blah, blah. Well, where do you get that from? Do you watch, like, any political shows or anything? No, I don't watch none of that. I don't believe in none of it. <laughs> no, no, but I can't Where I can't do you follow get your any view from, then? <laughs> Just what other people tell you to believe? I mean, you have no... Education. You're just going off of what other people tell you. It is ridiculous. Watch the watch the news where they have both people's point of view on Sunday. They have Republicans and Democrats there. You can take either one, but at least you get points of view. Our show is on a Fox News affiliate. I have no personal gripe one way or the other. I know who Fox News is. I know what what do you got there? That's the that's the state. Biden only won St. Louis County, whatever county Kansas City is under, and it looks like the entire state is red, or is that Columbia? Yeah, Probably that's Columbia. Columbia. Yeah, and Columbia. Columbia. That's is it. Blue. Springfield so is red. Down, Everything red. down by Semo. Jet- like all red. It's so all no red, blue guys. All. This is what I'm trying to tell you. You <laughs> people are the Pam Hubs of our lives. Like you just walk around doing and saying dumb stuff all the time, and you're sitting there going, "Oh, I can't believe that you would say that about me." Why not? Well, here's. No one else is telling you this stuff to your face. And here's this the is the way. problem. This is why you couldn't understand. There's a listen. Donald Trump was elected president in 2016. No liberal stopped him. He was allowed to do four years of service as president of the United States. Yeah, he was impeached twice because he deserved it. Because they had things against him. Yeah, he was able to get out of it because Mitch McConnell in the Senate had the extra people they needed to just wipe it under the rug. So we know that's how you got out from underneath it. You people are the problem at times. And the answer- at times. Not all the time. Not when you're at the baseball game paying $20 for a beer like me, enjoying Harrison Bader, catch something out in the outfield or what. Like, not then. No, 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 no. What Mike was talking about. Right. When you're hanging out at your house, at your garage with a buddy of yours, you start talking politics. They ask you where you're getting your information from. You're like, I don't care about that. I don't watch the news. I don't need the news. The news don't need to tell me nothing. I get it from my buddy at the bar. He tells me all my politics. (laughs) Well, that's wrong. 
But with that being said, you know, the the problem is is people just are dug in on misinformation and they don't want to hear anything else and it's just it's gotten out of control. Misinformation in the information age is out of control. You know, one of my biggest problems guys that I have with the way our information is set up nowadays, uh, especially with this whole um, social media side of things, okay? I, 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 we just have to get this under control. Right. I just, we think, I have think, got to get I this, think social this media idea. social media and politics, period. I think All that politics. you should have to take a test before you're even allowed a license to yeah. go onto the, the internet vote. and discuss or <laughs> anything. Like, I, I just don't know. And here's the thing. Like I said, we're a Fox News affiliate. I don't hate the ideas of conservatives or their ideas because when you're talking to a conservative about political ideas, quite often being a moderate, I find things that I agree with, certain deregulations and other things like that. Like, I find things that I am definitely common ground. In fact, famously, this past week, I had one of these situations. You guys will love this. Person comes up to me and goes, uh, I introduce myself. Oh, yeah, I'm Mark Bland. They go, oh, yeah, 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 I know who you are. You're that guy. I don't I don't, I don't agree with anything you say at all. Like, I, I know you. Like, I, like you, you talk about that stuff. And I said, oh, that's weird because I agree with at least half of the stuff you say. And he stopped in his tracks for a second and he looked at me and he could, he was confused and he's like, he doesn't understand. You're the closed minded one, not Mark. Mark's the one who's the moderate. I'm pulling from both sides. I said, I agree with half of your stuff. And if you gave me five minutes of your time and we got to sit here and talk a little bit and kind of rapitate about different things in our worlds, you would find out very quickly. Oh yeah. Mark lines up with certain things like, Hey, like my guy's over there. Mike, you, Mike, what's one of the biggest things that we make fun of when it comes to Republicans and conservatives, how they have really tiny what's because how big their what is. Mm. You should know this one. Oh. You should know this one riding around in it all day. Oh. You should know about <laughs> jacked up trucks oh, yeah. and the really tiny oh, wheels. Man. I get like, that all the time. People look at me and they go, and they go, oh man, I love you. I love the Trumpster. <laughs> I love you, big Trumpster, sir. And I'm like, they try to who, put a flag. Who, who, in who are you truck? talking about here? This like, is what I was trying to explain to people. The people <laughs> off the off the air don't know. Like Mike. Has a jacked up truck, uh, right? Yeah. Does he not? He has got the type of jacked up truck where you put the truck nuts on it and everything. But Mike is not a conservative no, like no. that. He is a moderate. I would say Mike's a lot like me in, in, in the way that he views things. He's kind of just to the left of the center. But for the most part, Mike kind of pulls from all these worlds because yeah. we grew up around it. All of our friends, all of our families, all of our friends' parents when we were growing up, they're all conservative here in St. Louis, right? I like to say I'm hated by both sides. You know what I exactly, mean? Exactly. But that's my point because that's like, all i got to do is just say you know for me i you know to be hated by uh the uh non-conservatives the liberals all i got to do is just say uh i don't like joe biden i think he's a knucklehead and he's slow and old and all of a sudden the liberals <laughs> hate me but it's true though i mean i think we have terrible choices for president and that's a problem that needs to be fixed but i think the root i of think it we've all had come- good ones along these lines where oh, these yeah, other yeah. bad ones have shown up i think the funny thing is is that everybody just kind of throws them by the wayside right disregard Guards them as of anybody that can, and, and, and now they're all like, "Oh well, Tulsi Gabbard, Howard. she's she's definitely it's, nope, no, she's not, oh no, God. she's not." Get out of here with that. None of these crazies that you guys like. And I got I got a guy that I know, um, and he he tells me all the time, "Oh, you need to listen to you need to listen to Candace Owens, and you need to read this book by uh, who's the one that they always and like what's to it throw out do there, for not Ayn Rand, but uh, the other one, Ann Coulter. No, the black guy who wrote the book that everybody. Uh, oh, Ben. Uh, no, 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 well, uh, no, no, no. You'll know the name the minute I can't remember it off the top of my head, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm, I'm having this conversation on the fly, but uh, uh, very well known Republican conservative, I, Thomas Sowell or Sowell or whatever. Oh, I, Sowell. S O W E L L or whatever. I think it's Thomas Soul or whatever like that. That person, you know, like they, they throw these things out. They're like, you need to read this. It's like, I've read that. See, your problem is, is you're coming to me in 2022 when I already have 30 years of experience when it comes to the political game and how this runs right. since the 90s. And you're sitting there going, well, you're just not smart. You need it. No, it's no. you. You need right. someone <laughs> to read today. Right. You don't have all these experiences. Yes, right. you lived life, but your life was working at this place, not researching politics all those days. Guys, 
What were all of these people doing in 1998 when social media didn't exist? Right. They didn't have any yeah. of these people to influence them, to tell them to read a Thomas Sowell book. Or, they were all normal. Like, what, 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 who were they talking to? How, that's the problem with social media. We give everyone a megaphone, megaphone to talk whatever they want to say. And the truth is there's a lot of people, the Pam Hups of the world, they don't need to say anything. Mm-hmm. They need to stay quiet and in a hole, in a <laughs> ground, and nowhere should be seen by light of day. And, like, these are just... Just not good people. And, and and you can sit here and say, well, Mark, all you're doing is bashing people who have this belief or that belief. No, I'm bashing dumb people, that people who make stupid decisions, people who hurt others with their decisions. There are Republicans right now, guys, not liberals. You wanted to be liberals. It ain't liberals right now. There are Republicans that are sitting there saying, well, we shouldn't be fighting Putin at all. We should be trying to help Putin out. Putin's friends with Trump. Putin's this guy. Putin's that guy. Really? They're on their TVs telling them that. Really? Well, then you got them. Then you got other ones going. We should take a stand against Putin. Then we do. And then they're like, gas prices are crazy <laughs> just because <laughs> just because the dang president that's in there. Hey guys, uh, well, guys, that's what I, taking a stand I against Putin I just want to let everybody know. I want to let everybody know. My gas price went from three ninety five to three eighty a gallon. Them damn liberals <laughs> coming down, saving me money again. How dare! them. If I don't have high gas prices to <laughs> complain about to everybody in the world, I'm just not happy that day. It's like, no, 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 Missouri. And I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on Missouri. It's worldwide. It's it's nationwide for sure. But Missouri specific. Nope. You're just nuts. That's your thing. Like, you wake up every you day. for a reason yeah. to hate on the other team. You no, know what? Literally, literally. Howard Stern has the whack pack. Missouri just has Josh Hawley, and that's it. And the rest of you. Like, you know that's what? it. If, there's uh, no whack pack. The all-natural whack pack. If Missourians want to complain about gas, there's actually only one politician who purposely raised the price of gas in Missouri, and that's the Governor Mike Parson. All he right. passed the gas tax. That's right. The gas tax that raised it up. Ago. Okay. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here's the deal. It's time for us to hit our interview with Russ Faria. Uh, he is going to be with me here in just a minute on 105.3 FM, 1280 AM, KYRO News Radio, KYRO. And um, it's going to be an interesting conversation. I, I can no see idea. it already. But uh, after that, we're going to be back with uh, Mike Eyes as well as uh, Jason Call. And uh, we got a Blues game coming up here in a little while. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more on the backside. We'll see you guys in just a bit. Coming up right now, the Russ Faria Pam Hup interview. Welcome back to the Q, ladies and gentlemen. And as promised, I am sitting here right now, face to face, talking on a microphone with one Mr. Russ Faria. Russ, thank you so much for joining us here on the Q today. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, your case is crazy, man. That's a crazy life. Like, okay, let me ask you a question, okay? Just right off the bat. Let's get into some of this fun here that I want to get into. All right. If I would have told you at 13 years old, like a 13-year-old Russ, where, where are you living at 13? At 13, I was in Florissant. <laughs> you were living in Florissant. You're from Florissant? I am from Florissant. Born and raised? <coughs> yes, sir. Well, I moved out to... Uh, Look, where'd you go to high school? Fallon where'd you go to high 19. school? Hit it, hit uh, it. Hazelwood Central. There you go. Oh, Hazelwood North Central. County Tech. <laughs> oh, what year did you graduate Hazelwood Central? Uh, it would have been 88. Okay, I was 94 from McClure North. So we're within range of yeah, each other. Yeah. I used to hang out over on Manmaker Hill at Sioux Passage a few yeah. times. Okay. I've been down this road. I understand how this all works. You're from Hazelwood at a different time, though, because by the time you get to the early 90s, they start like, building Barrington and all the huge subdivisions across the street from it. So you're from it when it was a little bit more smaller, a little a little bit, a more, little bit a little yeah. more quaint, a little more quaint and stuff like that. Um, 1988, what a year. Spuds McKenzie, do you remember that? Spuds McKenzie, I like do. you probably have <laughs> memories being on the couch at 18 watching Spuds McKenzie commercials. I, I remember when MTV first came on here. <laughs> oh, yeah, do, people don't realize how. How important that was to us as a society. Like, I, you know, I, I worked in music and I made my money in music and, and I've done a lot of things. But at the same point, like where my influences come from, you're like you said, MTV blew the doors off for a lot of people. They had no clue. Yep. They didn't know that that was coming. Like they, they really didn't. And once it started. It there was no style. Like, Michael Jackson doing Thriller, the video, and then on MTV and debuting it and all that, and then the, the run with it. Like, that literally opened up 1984 and pop culture to me. That was probably the best part of the 80s. Mm-hmm. The pop culture. Oh, yeah. About, like, the 70s had pop culture, too, but 
It didn't infiltrate the same way as it did in the 1980s. It wasn't as widespread. It wasn't as widespread. I think that the Madonnas and the Michael Jacksons put focus on it, Mm -hmm. made it important to be a movie actor, made it important to be a TV show host, made it important to be a music artist. You know, like they really niched these things out and said, hey, these are important things. And by the way, we're changing your life. We're changing the way you view things. We're changing the way you handle things. All of that. Like, I get it. I get it. I totally get it. So, but if I told a 13-year-old Russ Faria that he was going to end up dealing with what he ended up dealing with, how would have that Russ handle that information? What do you think? In the back of your mind. I know it's a weird question to start off with, but trust me, we'll get there. Well, well, knowing knowing who I was at 13. Yeah. Uh, I probably would have laughed and told you you're full of shit. <laughs> sure. Sure. Um, but I wouldn't be. And that's the sad part. The sad part is, is that at some point in your life, you were going to marry a woman. You were going to fall in love. And that was going to be taken away from you. And that's not fair. Not fair to her. That's not fair to you. It's not fair to anybody in the situation. At the same point... It's the world, the world we live in. And um, I said off the air to you, I said, there's a lot more to your case that I thought was indicative of Missouri, Missouri people. Um, Let's start with uh, you. And and, and like I said, I'm not trying to get into some dateline thing here. I have questions. I got interesting questions that I want to ask you. And I want to discuss this with you because this TV show is on the air right now. Ladies and gentlemen, the uh, the thing about Pam, right, is on NBC currently. There's uh, yes. a person who portrays you, obviously, in the show. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Glenn Fleshler. Glenn Fleshler. And um, the way the show comes off is a little kitsch. Let's be honest, okay? It starts off with Keith Moore's like, on a cold Christmas night in 2000. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like that deep voice where he's doing the weird, ominous yeah. thing. It kind of comes off a little, uh. And then she's like, I'm the perfect mom. I'm Pam. This is my husband. He thinks I'm great. Like, it's just interesting how they're playing it off. Because in real life, it didn't probably feel like any of that to you. No, you know, no. it felt like like your life to you. You know, this almost looks like a and I hate to say this because I'm not trying to downplay or make it look bad. But it almost feels like a, a sketch, like a Saturday Night Live comedy sketch version of what technically is your real life story. How do you view that? Do you think that this is being true to form and the true to light or not? Well, it's entertainment. You know, fair it's enough. not a That's documentary. Uh, it was never billed as such. It's a dramatization. Um, I can guarantee you that. No, you're fine. There's, there's a lot in that movie, in, in this miniseries that either didn't happen or didn't happen the way they're that they taking show liberties it. with certain. Things. You know, they're right. It's artistic license, if you will. You know, and that said, it's entertainment. And the first episode was. A lot of people said campy, but they made the people. I say kids camp. Yeah, they made the people who looked, who acted ridiculously, look ridiculous on screen. Imagine if you'd never heard anything about this story and just tuned into it. That's a great point. You like, oh. so they did a little character introduction. They made Pam Hupp look ridiculous. They made the cops look stupid because that's the way they acted in real life, and they just well exaggerated. Let's it. go deeper. Let's go deeper. This is St. Louis people. That's why Pam Hupp is the way she is. You St. Louisans don't understand. And I'll say this in front of this man while he sits in front of me. You've got a attitude about you that is absolutely off the wall ridiculous. The way you handle yourselves, the way you interact with each other. It's a Missouri thing. I've run across yeah. this entire state. Listen, they call this the show me state simply because I got a chip on my shoulder. Knock it off. That's literally how all of you act. So when I see Renee Zellweger acting like Pam Hupp and I see interview archive footage of the Pam Hupp interviews from jail and stuff like this and the way she talks, I know every single one of your families have two Pam Hupps in them because I've met them. These bobbleheaded idiots that will say anything on the fly. I haven't met a lawyer in St. Louis that won't just tell me whatever they want me to hear at any given time. This is a St. Louis thing. This is an O'Fallon thing. This is a Troy thing. This is a Missouri thing. 
I've met the rural people. I've met the downtown people. Guys, I grew up here. We both grew up in Florissant. Went to the high schools and graduated from in Ferguson, Florissant. Well, mine was Ferguson, Florida. He was Hayesworth. My point being, hey, I lived off Villa Marie for a little while there. I know the villas over there behind uh, Hazelwood West and all that. Calm down. Calm down, St. Louis. I got you on lock for real at 46. My problem is when I saw that movie, Renee Zellweger literally looks like half the moms who live in O'Fallon already. Mm. And talked the way half the moms or more already talk to their husbands and their friends in O'Fallon in the rural areas of Missouri. You all are that. Deal with it. You're not good people. You will say and do anything at any time. It's ridiculous. I have been, I have been, Russ, Russ, I have been blackballed. I have been the, I have been attacked by the same type of people, not to your level, obviously, but I have been attacked by these same type of people who make accusations, who say that we'll just say anything to anyone. Bro, I changed my phone number because of a stalker, and within two days of having the phone number, there were only eight people I gave that new phone number to. Already was getting calls from the stalker again. Do you see how bad the people of this town and this city technically can be? I'm sure you do, because you went and sat in jail for that, did you not? Yes, I did. Is jail fun? No. Tell me the truth. First week of jail. Your first week of jail. How eye-opening was that for you as a person? And you're a person who works on motorcycles, hangs out with dudes in, in, in motorcycle clubs and things like this. Rough areas sometimes, right? Tell me about your first week in prison. How'd that go? Uh, in prison or in jail? Uh, they're two you, different animals. You just, well, <laughs> uh, well, you're right. Jail, they just want your bologna sandwich and they'll argue with you about it. Prison is, there's a leader. There's, there are people you have to play the game for. Prison is a, its own society in, in itself. Where were you at? Where were they Where they have you locked up at? I was at a place called Jefferson City Correctional Center. So you were at Jefferson City? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that's not the walls. The walls is there. The wall, not, this, walls is by Jeff City, though. The place I was at yeah. was the place that took the place of the walls when the walls closed. Okay, got it. So... All the same guys that were at the walls. Yeah, they're at Jeff City. Jeff City. Okay, now, first week, how you feeling? Tell me about your your thoughts. What, what what? How did your mind work that first week? The way that you have to learn the inside workings of prison. Well, I'm I'm an educated person. I went to college and everything, so um, that doesn't really do you any good there. Okay, because there's a lot of most of those guys don't even have a high school diploma there are some that that do and some that are educated as well and that's where you kind of start making connections you know your first week or two you try and make a buddy or two and hopefully you get a good celly you know because uh, they're worth their weight in gold you're living in a bathroom with another guy so if you don't get along with keep, that other guy <laughs> keep looking at everybody's feet to see who's wearing sneakers right at any one given moment i understand yeah. this yeah i get it go to your bunk put your sneakers on we'll figure it out Right, yeah. so you, you just got to kind of learn and get in with the right people. And uh, a good friend of mine uh, recently said, you know, you'll get a lot further being a nice guy and being a likable guy than you will being a tough guy. Because if you're a tough guy, there's always somebody tougher than you. Exactly. But if you're a nice guy and people like you, then there's probably going to be a couple of tough guys that like you. And if somebody has a problem with you, They'll take care of it for you. You yeah, don't have fair to worry enough. about that. I'm just, the, the reason I'm asking is, is it's probably not something that was ever on your peripheral in the first place. So to go from uh, hanging out with your friends on the night that this all happens, you know what I'm saying, right. to I'm in prison now and I have to potentially think about if someone just hears the story or just thinks that I'm the whatever or blah, 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 or just I look at someone wrong in here today, right? I might get shanked in the shower tomorrow, like done game's over. It doesn't matter how nice I was or how mm -hmm. tough I was. Oh, yeah. and that's what I'm saying. Like it had to be a mind oh, for you to ooh, excuse my language, but like oh, it no. had to, be. <laughs> it had to be. Oh, it, it was. I mean, first there was jail and right. You know, that's its own animal. Like I said, and, uh, they had me in what they call the hole or solitary, whatever you only get. They put you right. into solitary. Right. Now, why they put you into solitary when you were there? Well, because they're trying to break me. 
They even went so far as to... What, why would they... You're already in jail, though. You're already... Are, is this in jail or is this in prison? In jail. Oh, this is in, in jail. jail. So in jail, they put you in solitary. Mm-hmm. Now, mind you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get into the, the final... Let, let's, what let's, they call let's, administrative segregation. Let's, uh, <laughs> let, let's get into this a little bit. So you uh, were an avid uh, gamer or something like the, to that effect? Yeah. Would you do, you were you like board games, Dark Dungeons and Dragons, things like that? Or yeah, what, that type like, of game. You know, what, what were, were you into? Was, uh, like, what, yeah, what were you it was called Warhammer. Oh, I know what Warhammer is. Yeah, yeah, I've seen the little characters and all that. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, we even play like another board game called Warhammer 40K. Which okay. Is, you know, so we were into. And this is you like and your that. group of friends, right? Yeah. The ones that you were visiting the night of said murder. Yes. Of your wife. Um, now, your wife had an illness. She she had cancer. She had already be- dealt with this once before in her life. Yes. And she was on her second bout with this. Right. She had uh, been diagnosed and then went through treatments and whatnot. And uh, once she got declared cancer-free, she was able to go to reconstructive surgery because she had had her breast removed. Okay. So she had the surgery, and some of the wounds from the surgery weren't healing up exactly the way you would expect them to. She went back to her... uh, We are altering the human body in mass ways. I understand this. She went to her primary doctor, I think it was in October, so 2011, and the doctor called us on vacation and says, uh, you know, you probably want to go see your oncologist when you get back because uh, this doesn't look good. Oh. So we went and saw the oncologist when we got back, and he says, yeah, he says, uh, it's breast cancer is spread to the liver, which I didn't know. I thought, breast cancer is only in your breast. Exactly. If you don't have those, then, hey, you're out of that day. That makes sense. You know, but that makes sense. Yeah, I get it. It's just the type of cancer that it is, and it had spread to her liver. It was inoperable. Mm. And, uh, you know, you got to ask the hard questions at that point and say, you know, hey, Doc, how, mu- how much time do we got here? You know, and that's, he said three to five years um, at that point. You know, it could be less, could be more. Now, did the doctor think that on this second bout at all that she was going to be able to get out from underneath it at all? Like, it sounds like they, they, they're they like they giving her a, a sentence off the top three to five years right off the bat. Well, um, he was going to do what he could do, you right. know, but... And was she responding? Sound. Let me ask, at the time uh, that this all happened, uh, she was going to chemo? Yeah. Was she responding? Was it was it working? Like, was, were things going well or no? Uh, no, I thought so at the time. She actually, uh, Betsy was a very positive person. She's like the old president used to say. She never met a person she didn't like. Yeah. And I guess maybe that's how she kind of fell in with Pam or whatever. But at any rate, um, she's always a positive person. She liked to be active her whole life. That's the way she was. She was very good at softball when she was in high school. Uh, so she was a physical person. And one of her favorite things to do was to go out and play tennis. So... Uh, if you know anybody that's ever gone through chemotherapy, and I think everybody Very probably deep. does at this point in time. Yeah. But uh, sometimes uh, when they get done with their chemo for a day or two, they feel like Superman and they can go fly and they're bulletproof and everything right. else. And then the next two or three days after that, they don't feel like doing anything but laying in the bed. So on her days when she had all this energy, she was out doing tennis and she was remaining positive. And I think that has a lot to do with uh, surviving that condition or surviving it longer than you might if uh, somebody gives you that sentence and you just say, okay, well, I'm just going to lay here in the bed or sit here in the house. All right, uh, Russ, we're going to take a quick break here on 1280 AM KYRO and 105.3 FM. And when we come back, we're going to have more with Russ about uh, the situation that he had to deal with with Pam Hupp in O'Fallon, Missouri, in Troy, Missouri, and your life. We're going to talk more about your life. We'll be back on KYRO right after this. Welcome back to News Radio 105.3 FM, 1280 AM, KYRO. Mark Bland, your host here on The Cube. Join today, Russ Faria, uh, famously a part of the new uh, NBC TV show, The Thing About Pam, based on his life. What happened to him in his life? Uh, you, uh, How'd you meet Betsy? How'd I meet Betsy? How'd uh, you guys meet? Well, she worked at a local gas station. Okay. It was, uh, when I moved out here, he was getting area. big gulps was, all the time. I get it. Was it was kind of rural, so that was like the closest convenience store to where I lived, and so I was in there quite frequently. And you know, we 
And for anybody out there that knows like about KYRO, Moscow Mills, that's where our station is from. Like this is it's in Lake St. Louis now and in St. Charles County. But like uh, we are Lincoln County, like this station came from. And at one point I used to drive from Hazelwood where you grew up yep. all the way to Moscow Mills every single Saturday and Sunday to do my radio show live for, you know, KYRO. And uh, up that way, I know it's rural. Like, there's not a lot going on there. In fact, our radio station was literally on the top of a hill above a biker bar. Right. Right there. <laughs> there's a biker bar at the bottom of the hill, and it was right off the highway. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So, like, oh, yeah, I get it. I mean, you might have been to that bar a few times, uh, if you re- even know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, so, anyway... Uh, it is rural. So you meet Betsy at the gas station. Yeah. You guys yeah. strike up a relationship. Yeah, and we it, started hitting it off a little bit, and she was kind of going through a divorce at the time. Now, what year would this be? Uh, I believe that was would have been 98. So, okay, so you guys were together for quite a long time prior to her murder. Oh, yes. Um, and uh, now the children, the daughters, right? Mm-hmm. The daughters are from the first marriage. Or do you have a child together, you and Betsy, at no, all? No, we do not. Okay. Um, she, was that a choice? Was that something that was just, you just had the kids already and life just kept moving? Uh, she had the kids from a prior relationship before her first marriage. Right. And then, Oh, from before her first marriage. So, right. so there's another person, then there was the marriage, then there was you. Correct. Got it. Okay. And um, so she had gotten herself fixed after having two children. I she see. didn't want to have any more, so... You know, we, and those are two daughters, right? She's mm-hmm. two daughters. Yes. What's their names again? Just first. Leah names. Mariah. Leah Mariah. Now, um, Russ, the daughters, where where are they at in this whole situation? Like, what do they think about the murder? What do they think about this situation with their mom? And well, as your accusations against you and then what eventually comes out from Pam down the road years later like where 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 are they fall into all this um well, and have you talked to them about it at all like have you had any real so like obviously you were still their dad before you went to jail there married to their mom still even though she's dead like you're still a part of their lives like obviously you guys had to have had conversations in the early days especially when um, it first happened when they first had me in for questioning then i got out and we had to plan a funeral on that and then we yeah. had some contact there and it seemed okay then. And then once I was arrested, um, for whatever reason, there very quickly was two sides. And so they turned on you? Like yeah. they were against you? Like it was, uh, he obviously did this or he would have do- done this to my mom? Like there wasn't this understanding that maybe you didn't do this at all? From them, from them. Um, to my knowledge, and, and at the time, no. Um, very quickly, two sides were drawn, and it was like my family over here and Betsy's family over there, and little benuns to me. Which under, is understandable in the earliest part of this, where you are obviously the accused. Right. You are the one they are looking at as the main source of this problem. So, obviously, her family isn't going to, like, jump in bed with you anytime soon on that, obviously. I, I can see why the, the sides would separate. Um, has there been any discussions with the daughter since all this has gone down? Since you've been out of jail, since Pam has gone and, and become, obviously, the one who did it, you know, like, has there been any conversations with you and the, the girls since then? No, um, because... Has there uh, even been an attempt? I don't know how sincere an attempt has been made or not. Um, basically, because of everything that went down, I mean, they testified against me twice, you know, um, both of them, they stole ten thousand dollars out of my bank account within an hour of me being arrested, and all those things. And they're saying I said this and said that. Um, Where they seem like they're doing Pam Hup type stuff, right? Like so, right off the bat, like here's that's that's funny. That's it. Like once again, what I say at the beginning of the show, everybody, this is a Missouri people issue. This is not something I'm making up or Russ is making up. This is how these people act. So within minutes of something going down, minutes of something going down, they're already into his bank account, taking 10 G's like they're Pam Hupp. Mm -hmm. Pam Hupp's not even been arrested. We're not even going to get to Pam Hupp for a few more years. These girls are already into this dude's bank account, taking that money, turning on him immediately. Okay. 
And to this day, you said you haven't talked to them, right? There have There's been several occasions and times when somebody that knows, like a, somebody you know, who knows somebody who knows somebody said, "Hey, come up this, to me hey, and say, oh, well, hey, they would like to meet with you or talk with you." And for obvious reasons, my answer always has to be, "Well, if they would like to do that, they can call Mr. Joel Schwartz, and we'll have a meeting at his office so that nobody can say anything that anybody is going to put any words in anybody's mouth, and everybody feels safe." If you're sincere, call Joel. He's in the book. And so right now here on the show, the right here on the show, you're saying, hey, you're willing to talk to the daughters. If they want to talk, we can talk like for real. But it's going to be above board and it's going to be with our lawyer present. And we'll have and this I conversation him to bring a lawyer too. yeah, bring <laughs> your lawyer, too. But OK, girls, there you go. There you go. Your mom was murdered by Pam Hupp. Maybe you believe it. and Maybe you don't. I have absolutely no understanding of that. But at the same point, Russ is sitting here live on KYRO on our show right now saying, if you want to talk, we can do this. This can happen. I think that that's a fair, I, I think that you're throwing out the olive branch there. It doesn't sound like you've set up something nefarious or anything. You're like, bring your lawyer. I got my lawyer. We'll have a sit down and talk. We'll discuss this out. But yeah, I think there's a lot of things that you got on your chest, don't you? That you oh, want yeah. to get off to them. There's, there's, because there's, they're, that, that $10,000, first off, that just right off the top, that $10,000, we need to talk. What you doing going into my account at all? Right. Well, what, what, what's that got to do with a murder? Your mom's dying or dead. What is? What are you doing? These are. This is craziness. Like, I don't understand. I, I agree with you, Russ. That's craziness. Like, this is not the focus at this point. This shouldn't even be a focus. Money should be. For Pam Hupp, that's a different story. Right. She, what she's trying to put together with insurance fraud, completely different story. You two, unless you're in bed with her. Right. Unless you're in bed with her. Girls, are you in bed with her? That's pot. I don't know. Well, there's been a couple of people that said something to that. There might have been so. people who've said those things. Maybe maybe that genius prosecuting attorney that started this all off, maybe maybe she knows some of the things that are going on. Because to me, and see, that's the other thing. You said that the TV show on NBC makes everyone look ridiculous on purpose mm -hmm. because of the way they acted, the way that they handle things. They were being ridiculous. Yeah. Once again, Missouri people being Missouri people. You're all ridiculous. You're stealing money out of people's accounts minutes after they're like arrested. You can't even figure out how to do your job as a prosecuting attorney correctly. These police officers are like, oh, I can't believe that there's blood prints in his house. Yeah, it's his house. What did you expect, fools? What did you expect? Think about that. This is why I don't like growing up in Missouri. I feel like I'm the smartest person in this state every day, all day long, 24-7, 365. 366, even on leap years, fools. Like, it's out of control how bad this is. It's out of control. I, Russ, I am literally mentally fried by the fact that I've come on my show a million times and said, Missouri people, right? Whether, listen, most of the people who did the interviews, this is what I told you, the media, most people who did the interviews, they just wanted to use it to get their profile up. They didn't give a shit about Russ. They didn't give a crap about Pam Hupp. They're just trying to get the name out there. They just wanted to talk the story so that they look pretty. They're just pretty people reading Facebook posts half the time. By 2011, by the way, Facebook existed. Yeah, people exactly. were on Facebook. People were talking. Social media was hammering. It's not 2000. It's not 1911, right? It's 2011. So, yeah. So, I understand this. So, I got the mental illness that is Trump supporters who vote Trump in Missouri. With, and I know you're like, oh, how are you going to say? You do. Except the fact that you guys look yourselves in the mirror and vote for Trump. Stop being mad about the fact that you choose to do that. That's your choice, okay? And that's a lot of people in Lincoln County. Correct, Russ? Sure. That's a lot of people yeah. in St. Charles County because it's a rural area, right, Russ? Okay. Yeah. So they just have to be accepting of who they are. The Pam Hubs, the soccer moms with the bobbleheads who vote for Trump because their husband says they need to. Yep. Yep. We know. Just like that idiot from Storage Wars with the damn garage. Yep. Yep. Over and over. Yep. Everything I say on this show is true. Russ literally got run through the ringer over this for no reason. You were accused. They said that you murdered your wife in cold blood. Yep. I think the one thing that does blow people's minds, though, starts off right at the beginning of that show. 
The only truly damaging thing that I can see against you, Russ, okay, is the fact that when you make the phone call originally, you said it was a suicide, looked like a suicide. And with a ne- with a knife sticking out the back of a human being's, like, was the knife in the side, the back? In the side. In the side, okay. It's possible. You, you could stab yourself in the side of the neck, you know. I've seen crazier videos on Live Leak in the internet, like right. just like you have. Um, at the same point, like, was she depressed? Obviously, she was depressed. Like, she was going through stage four cancer. Right. For the, she was cancer. going for the second time. She, she was, was dealing depressed. with the chemo. She was depressed, yeah. Uh, she had dealt with depression her entire life, took medication for it, and even threatened and attempted suicide a couple of times. She was hospitalized. She was pulled over by a police officer a couple of years prior and was suicidal and a police officer is obligated to take you to the hospital at that point for, for sure. observation yeah, for, for sure. three days. Um, so that had happened. Um, I'm not a forensic analyst or anything like that, and I don't recommend anybody walk in and find that type of scene with their loved one. And, and if you do, you're not going to spend a whole lot of time investigating the wounds. You know, uh, you're going to take a quick look at things, and you're going to be very upset. And then you're going to have to do what you're going to have to do, which is what you're and, trained and, to do. But but but, but that, that call nine one one. But there <laughs> it is, ladies and gentlemen. Like uh, as a proper human should. It wasn't like he tried to hide anything or go anywhere or do anything. Immediately calls nine one one. Right. The police immediately come to his house. We have dated receipts, right? Now, that's an interesting one. In the movie, they make it look like you go to Arby's. But from an interview I saw, it was your friend who went and grabbed something for you from no, no. Arby's? Or how? Um, I actually went to Arby's. You went to Arby's. Leah, whatever she wants to call herself. She started off as Leah Womack and then became Leah Askey. Now she's Leah Cheney. Um, Wait, why does, who's this person? She's a friend of yours? No, she Leah, can't... Leah is the prosecuting attorney. Oh, oh yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Like, like um, I, I keep remembering Lomar, Tim Lomar. Like, like Tim Lomar is like, St. Charles County. R- right, exactly. But, um, you know, there's a lot of players in this game here, right. bro. Uh, listen, when there's a lot of, listen, every circus needs a lot of clowns. That's all I'm saying, okay? Okay, go on. So she, she made up a story that, I went home or, you know, went to my friend's house, dropped off my phone and then went home. And then one of my friends conveniently went to Arby's and brought me the receipt up there at my house. Friend had never been to my house, by the way, um, so that I would have. So these friends you were with that night, the friends you were with that night, uh, close friends of yours. Yeah. Uh, You still talk to them? Uh, A couple of them. Yeah. I mean, we kind of. Did, how did this? How did how did this all affect that relationship? Did they believe you did it? Also, were they like off the top, right in bed with like the daughters and everyone else? No, they were initially lied to, or not necessarily lied to, but misled. Um, the police separated them and questioned them. Of course, their stories all lined up with the same one that I was telling. I was there from this time to this time, but the police were leading them to believe that. Either I had done that before I came over there. Right. Or that it happened later than it did because they didn't have any time frame. And so they didn't know what to think until my lawyer contacted them and said, hey, this is what actually went down and this is when it happened and this is when the police are saying it happened. Um, okay. So you get railroaded for this. You get sent to jail. You sit down for how many years? Three and a half. Three and a half years to think about how you didn't do anything wrong. By the way, you were with friends that night, the, the night it happened, right? Correct. You guys were games or movies? What were you doing? Uh, that night we watched a couple of movies. What were you watching? Uh, we watched do we remember? the uh, newest Conan movie, which was... Oh, uh, yeah, I remember what that, that was like the... Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember it was, that. It was like, okay. It was rough with the weird... I'm an Arnold Schwarzenegger Conan guy, so... Fair enough. No, uh, no, no, that makes 80s sense. baby, right? We talk, we talk pop culture on And then show, the next yeah. movie we watched, I think we walked out on half of it, was called The Road. It was very boring, and nobody was really into it, so... Um, three years in jail. A lot of time to think, a lot of time to process. What What's your typical day like 
when you're in jail and that is how you've been put there against your will for no reason whatsoever. You didn't do it at all. Eventually, this person is going to come forward and basically like, like I, I can sit here and discuss the Pam Hub side of this, guys. OK, I really can't. But it's like all she did was just tell everybody a new story every other day. And then like like once she got there's a homeless man drug into this. Like, out of the blue, years down the road. And then she tried to pin it on you again. So yeah. you sit in jail for three and a half years. They get you out eventually. They realize, oh, this situation with Pam is the real truth and this, that, and the other. And the minute that you get out, she's still trying to throw you under the bus and say, you're part of the thing. Like, her story becomes, oh, he was not there. He's part of it. He just wasn't right. there at the moment. Like, he was a part of this. Like, he's become part of this conspiracy, yeah. and he needs to go back to jail again. There seems to be a—you know what? Let's take a break, break here on KYRO. When we come back, we're going to talk about this aspect. We're going to talk about this secondary aspect, this part where Pam gets caught, and you get released from jail. And we're, we're going to talk about that because this is important. This is really important for people to understand this, okay? Oh, yeah. We'll be back on KYRO right after this. Welcome back to the queue. Mark Bland joined today by Russ Faria. And Russ, your story is crazy. Pam Hupp befriends your wife, uh, just for the people who might be tuning in, befriends your wife, uh, helps her out. Is a help. Let's be honest. You know, yeah. Pam up up front, off the top. She's taking her to and from uh, these different appointments. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. Uh, your impression of Pam at that time, like, were you guys good, cool, friendly, or not? I'm not. I understand today. I'm just saying, at that time, before the murders, what was your relationship with Pam like? I had only really met her a handful of times. You know, really. Um, she was a coworker at Betsy's at first, so. If I stopped in where Betsy so she, was working. Oh, so she worked at the gas station, too? Um, well, after Betsy and I got married, Net, Betsy went back into the Oh, that's right. This is business. year. That's 98. Like, this year's down the road. She went into right. the insurance business. Okay. And uh, so she was training Pam or whatever there. And um, if I would go into the office, I'd see her Interesting. In there. She was into the insurance game. Mm -hmm. And then weirdly, the insurance game seemed to be where the fraud comes from. The in same the, insurance company the, that they worked for. Interesting. So interesting. Which she got fired from one of the insurance offices for suspicion of forgery. Really? So she's just being all Missouri all the time. I got it. I get it. Listen, this, ladies and gentlemen, I, so I don't even want to stop. I want to keep moving. Because there's so much to talk about. So you're sitting down in jail. Right. This woman, Pam Hupp. Uh, now, they say famously, did they think they think that she killed her mom? Possibly. Right. Po there's a potential there. Like, we're not saying that it happened. We're saying um, there's talk on the table potentially that she did kill her mom. It looks quite possible. Yes. it looks quite possible. But at the same point, she was never brought up on charges for that. Now, was that before your wife? No. Or was that after your wife? That was after my wife. So that's after your wife. Now, where does the second murder come in? How does she get caught, Pam? Well, how she got caught was, and it's kind of a convoluted story, but you got to realize who we're talking about here. We're already dealing with crazy <laughs> detectives, right. prosecutors, Missouri people, Pam up. Like, it's nuts. Keep going. So she went hunting. She just went like, hunting. Just like you would go hunting for deer or rabbit or yep. anything else. She went hunting for another victim. And she wanted, initially, I believe, to find somebody that was close to where I was because the first person she approached that uh, got away. So you're already in jail, though. That's the funny thing. You're already in jail. Oh, no. This is after I got out. Oh, this is after. Okay. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. So you get out. Because of what, then? It's not because they catch Pam with a secondary situation. Why do you get out, then? Uh, I got out because, one, this was just such an egregious case, and I think that the appeals court was looking for a reason to throw this back. But uh, we got out on a little thing called the Mooney Motion, which was the third time in the history of our entire state that this has happened. 
because uh, normally an appeal takes at least 10 years, 10 to 14 years generally. Isn't it weird how we have computers and the ability to like, and all you got to do is look at these things and go, yes, no, yes, no. And we're like, it's going to take 10 years. And it's like, why? It's a five minute conversation. Why does it got to take 10 years? Because all the red tape you got to go through. Red tape for what? Nothing. There's nothing. Right. That's my point. There's no, no there's the red tape up half the time. Most of these things are pretty obvious off the top. And, and this one was, but... Um, Obviously, the appeals court was appalled by this. And so as soon as they got my lawyer's brief and on the appeal, they directly sent something back to Lincoln County and said, you need to have a hearing to see if this man gets another trial. And uh, if he doesn't get another trial, we're going to be mad, <laughs> basically, okay. is what that that's said. Fine. OK, you know, that's the long and short of it. Condensed that's version. And uh, so as soon as they scheduled that, they, they sent that back. The original judge. Minimeyer, uh, she recused herself because she knew she's buddies with Leah Askey. You know, they've been friends since high school and whatnot and been seen out in public. So she recused herself. And then we ended up with uh, the Honorable Judge Stephen Omer, which uh, had a really good reputation. I mean, he's a whistleblower among his peers. So uh, we knew he was a fair guy and we'd get a fair shake at it. And so we... So you went for that move, and that was able to get you out of jail. And from there, Pam got mad. Pam gets mad that you're out of jail then. I got out of jail in June, and I had another trial. What year is this? 2015. 2015. I had my second trial happened in November of 2015, and um, that's when I was exonerated. In August of 2016—oh, sorry— in August of 2016, she uh, went hunting, and she approached a young lady uh, that lived right across the street from one of my best friends. Okay. And Interesting actually, how she keeps within range of you the entire time. Yes. And at uh, any rate, she uh, approached that gal, and initially was asking about a babysitter. And this girl was a little suspicious and says, you know, what's somebody riding around in the neighborhood just asking people about a babysitter yeah, why just because you you're doing sitting on this? a porch? You're like a 50-year-old lady. Why and are you- then uh, somehow or another she got an excuse to get her in the car or something. But this girl was smart and she put a couple of knives in her jacket before she <laughs> went Whoa, out there. Okay. And then Pam changed her story and started acting like she was a Dateline producer. And uh, they're going to go now. See, that's the other thing. Calls. That's that's the other thing about this. Like by this point in history, Dateline has done some episodes about you in this case. Like uh, talked by that about point, this. I believe we'd done three or four episodes. Okay, so like it's it. it this is probably for Dateline. Dateline gets millions of cult like. I won't say millions. That's an exaggeration. But there's hundreds and hundreds and thousands of cases per year that are cold cases that are of the same level and and, and statues that you're dealing with. Your case, though, four episodes, three or four episodes of this show. And it's like one of only a couple shows in history that they've done more than one or two shows Uh, on. To today, we have five. Five. Uh, we have already recorded the sixth, which and a is, TV and a TV show to go with, and it. a TV show and a podcast. Um, the sixth episode will be airing on April fifteenth. The previous. I feel like the people from the t- from the podcast serial are kicking themselves for not choosing this as the first case. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Right, yeah. Like, you remember how popular serial was oh, when yeah. it first came out? And everybody wanted to listen to the episodes of the podcast, and it's like this seems like the case that would have made serial serial, but it's not. Like, nope. it's making Dateline Dateline. It's making these other things. Dateline, uh, the producer was, uh, they didn't want to do the show. And the producer really stuck with it because she was very passionate about it and thought that it was going to be a good show. And again, we're up to six episodes. The previous record on Dateline was uh, held by two people, was John Bonet and O.J. Simpson. Wow. So uh, you're up in the same. Yeah, your case is in the same ether as Jean Benet Ramsey and the OJ Simpson trial. Well, I surpassed it a bit because they they stopped at three. Yeah, you're still going. I'm at six. Yeah, you're still going. Probably going to do more. So now uh, between me and you and everyone listening to the show, uh, 
obviously you're involved in some of these things. You get a cut or you're a part of this. Like, I'm not saying like you're trying to get money or anything. I'm saying like, like they obviously have to have your say so or sign off on this, like the movie, the TV show with Renee Zellweger and maybe not so much the documentary type stuff, but they, they there's a sign off there, right? Like they come to you and they're like, hey, listen, this is going to be a part of your life. So we, sh- we want you to sign off on this. Like they want well, you they, to be a part want, of the show. They want your blessings. Blessings. Yeah. You correct. know, but they're going to do better it. Be, they better be with coming with, without them. But they should be coming with a check to you is what I'm saying. Like if they're going to do a show about your life and paint you in a specific way to the world. Oh, right? it, would be, it would be nice. But basically because of doing five Dateline episodes. Wait a second. Let me get this right. You're not making money not at all. all this TV show with Renee Zellweger. Not a dime. R- Renee Zellweger is going to play, listen, a woman, listen, Renee Zellweger. I want everyone out there in America to listen to me right now. And this is not a knock on Renee Zellweger, but Renee Zellweger is going to play a woman who killed this man's wife, took his love of his life away from him. She's going to pocket a couple million dollars here, five million, whatever it is to do this TV show. This man lost everything, sat in jail. Something I guarantee you, a Renee Zellweger would never do unless she guest starred on Orange is the New Black in her life. But she's going to pocket $5 million, $10 million, whatever it is. It's speculation. These are the numbers I'm throwing around. To do a TV show while this man sits here and makes nothing off of his own life story? That doesn't make any sense to me, America. Once again, we have all these lawyers who like to do all these things. Why are you not getting paid, Russ? Why aren't you civil suiting that district attorney or the, the prosecuting attorney? Why is there no civil suit? Have you gone any civil suits? Have I you have. tried? I have. I sued uh, three of the police uh, detectives, Ryan McCarrick, Patrick Harney, and Mike Merkel, and also the prosecuting attorney, Leah Askey at the time, Cheney now. Yeah, she's um, changing her name every other day of the week. Well, it's, she, it's weird. Like, she changes she, husbands like most people change their underwear. She seems like a typical Trump supporter. And I'm if, assuming if, that she probably voted Trump. Like, I'm just saying, like, it just is screaming this to me at this point. If you've watched the, the, the miniseries a little bit, they allude to uh, a little extramarital activity she was having with one of the detectives, which was, oh was truth. God. That is truth. They didn't exaggerate that. Oh, my God. You people can't just stop shooting yourselves in the foot. It is constant, Russ. What are you doing, St. Louis? Missouri. What are you like? What is wrong with you? This is how the Michael Brown situation sets the whole country on fire. Michael Brown was unknown. Nobody knew that 19-year-old kid from Ferguson. Russ, did you know Michael Brown before the day he was his name became like synonymous with racism and everything? like did you know him? No, no one did. St. Louis, you are on one. You will create a problem anywhere at any time. You will shoot yourself. What are you doing? Why do you think guys like me are so honest about you? You you will just do anything to anyone for any reason. This is ridiculous. Oh, my God. Okay. So you're not getting paid. And no. that's kind of a tragedy in this situation. I'm sorry. That's not a knock on you, Russ. I don't, I don't know what your lawyers were thinking at the time. But, like, if you got Renee Zoe, these guys coming in, and I understand the Dateline aspect, and they own Dateline, and your story is a documentary within Dateline, and because it's factual, documentary-based, you know, television and news footage and interviews like that, they can right. use that as recreative evidence for this show over here. And they don't really need your, like, It's public lesson. record. I've been on there right. five it's, times. Yeah. Uh, my lawyer and I both. How knew dare you, NBC? That they could do it. You know? But how dare you? Vine with the Dateline. God darn it, man. I just keep getting on this radio and I keep saying cuss words when I shouldn't because of you. You, St. Louis, because of you. What the hell? My God. Okay. So. I can't see is why NBC with the Dateline stuff. That makes sense. It's already in the books. It's archival news footage half the time. Like you're like OJ. You're like John Bonet's parents. Like like right. I get it. I get it. Okay, you're in the books. Columbine. You're in the books. But if you're gonna do a movie down the road years later, okay, I feel like you should be getting something for that, sir. 
That would be nice. I really do believe that you should be getting something for that, especially since this is your life that they took three, almost four years away of, of, of it away from you, right? While you're sitting in jail, you don't get to go watch movies like The Road that's boring. You don't get to go get some Arby's. Nope. You don't get to go to the gas station and meet a pretty girl and maybe eventually marry her. Nope. nope. You don't get to do any of that. What you get to do is sit on your hands, playing cards, talking to dudes that you never wanted to talk to in the first place because you weren't planning on meeting any of them anytime soon themselves. Correct. But Renee Zellweger didn't do that. This actress didn't do that. That actor didn't do that. All these people didn't do that. Like this is This is not like an indictment of them doing their show. I'm saying NBC, you owe this man. Give this man a dime. This this show right here that you and me are doing, this is proof you deserve the money. That's it. That's I said it. Fair enough. The world's out of You deserve the money on that. You deserve the money on that. Everybody's robbing you, stealing from you, putting you in jail. Like, you deserve the money on this. A man who's railroaded does not deserve. This is why I can't understand a person who didn't do something. They overturn the conviction after this man served 30 or 35 years. And they're 60 years old when they're getting out of jail. I don't yep. understand that to me like that. None of that makes sense to me because some of these things that they overturn these convictions on, it's almost blatantly obvious. Like it's right in front of their faces and they just mm. chose to ignore it because it was 1987. It was 1981. It was 73. Like, you see what I'm saying? Like it was, a, it was an eighth of weed in their pocket and they're serving 25 to life for this because it was 1979 when they got convicted. Yep. Do you see my point? Like these are ridiculous things. I'm not saying there are, listen, Russ, I will say this. I've gone on this show many times. We're going to take a quick break here while we're talking to Russ Freer. I've been on this show many times. I've had different people tip time in Leavenworth, other major prisons. Every single one of them has said the same thing, though. When they went and sat down and they got out of prison, I always asked him on the show here, did you do it? Like, did you, were you wrongfully, were you convicted properly? Like, did the people get you for it? And every single time they have said, yes. I did do the things they said. I sat down for that reason. Now, we're talking about the criminal who walked into the 7-Eleven, fired on the cash register. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's on the camera. Everyone knows it. But, like, he's just trying to tell everybody it wasn't that way. But when it all push comes to shove and 20 years later he gets out, he's like, yeah, I did it. Right. Because he's had enough time to really consider, oh, yeah, I did do that. And that's why I sat here for 20 years. Like, it sucks. You, on the other hand... They're pulling you out because they are proving that you're not doing any of this stuff. You're not right. doing any of it. You're not there. The times don't match up. You're getting Arby's. You're getting drinks of sna Snapple. Really, Russ? <laughs> Snapple? It was iced tea. <laughs> Whatever. God, Snapple, Russ. Like, come on, bro. I, I don't know about all that. But at the same point. At the same point, they should be giving you a little bit. We're going to take a quick break here. And when we come back, we're going to uh, finish up with our friend Russ Faria. And uh, we really appreciate him being here. We'll be back on the queue right after this. Saw you around the other day. Shorty, she was all the way. News Radio 105.3, 1280 AM KYRO. Mark Bland, Russ Faria, uh, NBC's The Truth About, or wait, what is it? Uh, the Thing About the Pam. Thing about the Pam. Thing About Pam is currently on NBC, and it's the story of Pam Hupp from O'Fallon, Missouri, and her murder spree, basically. It lasted over a few years. There seems to be definitely one person she did murder, which was your wife, Betsy. Mm -hmm. And then there was possibly, possibly, potentially, we'll just leave it out there with the word potentially, her mother uh, might have been taken out by her, which, by the way, also a uh, whole fraud insurance thing there, too. Weird yeah. that there was an insurance fraud thing here, then there's one here, and they can't figure out that the mom might have gotten pushed over the edge of the, bar or the, the railing. Like, it's, I, I don't understand, guys. Like, I feel like we could put two and two together, but, you know, Cheney asks you all that stuff. Got it. Right. All right. So, um, Pam Hupp is now dragging people into this. She went hunting, as you said, for a victim. She was able to find a homeless guy, right? A homeless uh, he guy. He was not a homeless guy. Or just he some guy, a, a random guy. He was a disabled gentleman and lived near, I think, where her daughter lived in St. Charles. And... Uh, I guess she found him sitting on his porch or whatever. And the gentleman had had a, a, a car accident several years prior, so he wasn't 
functioning at a very high mental level and, or physical level. Okay. And that was probably her biggest mistake. She didn't realize. Uh, she coaxed him into her car by offering to give him some money. Okay. To reenact the nine one one call, kind of like she did with this the is the producer person. aspect where she claims right. she's a producer but with she, a dateline and she's going to help him out. Yeah. Yes, and so she got him in her car and took him back to her house. I'm oh, sorry. And um, when they got there, that's when. Who knows exactly how it went down. But, but there was a call made and there was a tussle on the phone and you hear about them tussling and back and forth. And five gunshots and she unloaded 38 on the poor young man. And then claiming when, that there was a home invasion going on. She claimed that uh, he jumped in her car and held a knife to her and said that uh, they needed to go get Russ's money. They needed to go get Russ's money. We're back to you. Right, and she even put a note in his pocket to that effect. Now they uh, here's the thing. This is this is this is what confuses me. In 2011, our forensics is pretty solid by then. Okay, CSI has been on the TV stations for uh, about a decade at that point. Okay, right. Our forensics in America was pretty solid at that point. Right. Uh, fingerprints. Fingerprints on things? Like, how easy is this? Like, either these fingerprints are on these letters or they're not, right? If he's got a letter in his pocket, it's for Pam Hupp. Right. Right? Like, it's going to have his fingerprints on it, but did it ever have his fingerprints on it? Do we know? Did he touch the letter? Did he read it? Like, because he supposedly wrote the letter, it would have his fingerprints on it. I'm not sure if it was him or her that wrote the letter or whose fingerprints were on it. I do know that when the police were doing their investigation um, and the O'Fallon police were uh, much more thorough than the Lincoln County police, in fact, they... Pam threw my name out there, so they had to investigate me. Of course, because um, she can't stop getting close to you in every form or fashion. Right. I feel like Pam really just wants to be with Russ at this point, right? Getting Betsy out the way so that she can be with Russ, but she's got her own husband and weird thing going on in her life. Like, I don't understand this infatuation with you. I have no idea what goes through that woman's head. She's a... Tree. But she's nuts. But you can tell she's nuts, guys. Like, literally, if you watch these interviews, like, she just is saying things. Like, you can watch all the police interviews with her, and every time they investigate her or talk to her, her story changes a little bit. Like, there's there's something new that you she adds in or takes off. the same question off of, 10 times in a row. 10 different answers. In a row. Like, literally, <laughs> yeah. over a half an hour period, you're going to yeah. get 10 different answers. It's ridiculous. Um... So, obviously, uh, while she's in the middle of getting investigated for this shooting, right, there obviously your name's involved because of the letter and all this other stuff. How do they find out that she's the one who killed Betsy? Uh, well, Leah Askey was voted out prior to that. Um, I believe that would have been in 2017, 17, 18, 18, somewhere 18, around, there. around there. And a gentleman by the name of Mike Wood who had been part of her office when I was there. And um, after hearing her closing arguments in the first case, in the first trial, he left. He was appalled. And he wanted to come back there and change things. And when he uh, ran for election as prosecuting attorney, he used Betsy's case and my case as part of his running platform, making campaign promises. I'm going to open this case and take a good look at this thing again. And then uh, obviously he, he won and it was able to be happening. So and like, it's my belief that he kind of waited until after she took the plea in the murder of Mr. Gumpenberger, you know, because there was a lot of uh, things going on with that. And then soon. See, after and that's that, that's another thing that people don't realize. You and Pam were both offered pleas. You said no to the plea. You said, I'm not doing that. We're going to trial. I did not do this murder. Like, I, right. if they're going to, like, th I'm going to be carried by 12 or, you know, was it carried by six or convicted by 12? Like, you right. said that this is how this is going to go down. Like, I'm not, I didn't do it. And you're very, like, you're very, like, off the bat, the minute they tell you your wife was tied 25 times. You see you emotionally break down. Like, you just are like, I can't even believe that many times a knife went into my wife. Yeah, it's like it blew your mind. Like you emotionally were distraught and she takes the plea. 
She takes the plea, correct? She took what's called an Alfred plea. Alfred plea, yeah. But I'm just saying, like, she takes out. the plea. Yeah. <laughs> but, but she takes the plea yeah. still. That's my point. Oh, yeah. Like, if you really didn't do so, I've always said this, okay? This is, listen, listen, in politics, right? If Donald Trump really didn't do those things, if Joe Biden really, it's Hunter Biden, right? It's always Hunter Biden and his laptop, right? If Hunter Biden really did these, like, listen, if nothing really happened on January 6th, then just give all your information over to the court. When the Supreme Court asked for it on the January 6th communications, Republicans just hand it on over. If nothing happened, nothing happened, right, Russ? Like, right. you didn't do it. You you literally, from moment one, I did not do this. Correct. You stuck with I did not do this because you did not do this for all these years. It's easy to tell the truth. It's you don't easy have to remember to, your story. You don't have to remember your story. Exactly. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is what we're saying about politics in America. This is what we're saying about these bad people. When I call you Missourians or other people, bad people, and I know I've said it a lot of times on this show. I don't care. I'm not here to be your friend. I'm here to be a person who was born in the city of St. Louis, who was born in Missouri, who understands Missouri people and puts on a show to discuss these deeper topics. If you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to hide. Russ is proof of this. That's it. So you had nothing to hide. You're out Not of jail. All. Pam Hupp takes this Alfred plea. Correct. And uh, basically it states that she did do the murder to your wife. Uh, what the Alfred plea basically stated, and it, this was strictly for Mr. Gumpenberger's murder. Right. Was that the prosecution has enough evidence to convict me. But I'm not admitting any guilt. <laughs> I see. I see. So um, basically, you're going to go down for the murder of Gumpenberger, whether you right. like it or not. That's in the books. And then, Anything else they could attach to you ain't going to get attached to you, but they're just letting you know right off the top. Hey, we know you did this. And we, because she put my name all over it, so let's um, that gave the prosecutor up in Lincoln County, Mr. Mike Wood, more ammunition. And uh, last July... Uh, so coming up on a year now, last July, he announced formal charges against Pam Hope, which she pled not guilty to. So we're looking forward to a trial, which I get to be a witness for the prosecution. And uh, But moreover, what's happened most recently is that her people connected to Pam Hope seem to die. Um, her main defense attorney which is a public defender, had a heart attack and died just a few weeks ago. And so... Well, that was just... We said she's in jail. Yeah, right, exactly. but I mean, it's just weird coincidence that no, no, no. people right. connected to her just you're seem right. to... You're right, you're right, you're right. <laughs> now, I want to ask you a question. This is going to get a little nitty and gritty, okay? But you're you, you, you're dealt, you're you're floor some boy like me. You can get down a little bit. I put you're my good. big boy pants on you today. You put your big boy pants on. Um, why do you think Pam chose your, your wife? Like, she could have chose anyone in this world to play this game with. Why do you think she chose your wife? Did she really think that the cancer had, like, de de devolved her enough to where she thought she could use her against herself? Or was your wife just too nice of a person? Like, what do you think the reason was that she chose her? It's my belief that Pam is a serial killer. You think she's a serial killer? Well, by definition, I don't know. I mean, I feel like she would have. By to definition, have... if you murder three people, yeah, that's a serial killer. Okay, that's so, fair. I understand that. I'm just saying. If like, you want, if you want to put her mom in there, which fine. okay, okay it's okay. suspicious, whatever, potential. But okay, if if you include her mother, you're talking about Betsy. Yeah, your mom, her mother, and then and this Mr. Gumpenberg. Mr. Gumpenberg. Uh, she's definitely a sociopath. Oh, yeah, I would definitely say sociopath for sure. And psychological if look, issues. If you look at those three individuals, yeah. They all have something in common. They're either sick, disabled, or old. That's correct. No, no, no. That's a and really good way to look at it. killers all have an MO. Ted Bundy went after college girls. Right. Uh, uh, John Wayne Gacy went after children. Yeah. Right. Got it. Pam Hupp goes after sick or disabled people. Her mom had Alzheimer's. Now, now her, her husband, uh, what did Pam's husband do for a living? He was in construction. He was in construction. He was probably making decent money. I, it's not like she needed money. Was it that she needed money? I don't. Because it doesn't seem like if you're in a relationship, like me and my wife are in a relationship, obviously, you and your wife are in a relationship. Like, you've got money that comes in from your job, her job, you know, everybody's doing their thing. So, like, most people have money coming in in some form or fashion. Some people are greedy for more, and some people will do anything for it. That's true. 
I can't I can't deny that whatsoever. But um, Pam, I mean, uh, I'm here to say money isn't everything. You know, I'd trade all the money in the world to have this not have happened. But so is there? Let, let's talk about this aspect. You've dealt with this part of your life now for what? 11 years. Yeah, we're on our 11th year now. You're on the 11th year now. Mm -hmm. So 11 years of thinking about your wife's death, 11 years of losing and money being stolen from you and all the BS, plus the Dateline stuff, the movie, the TV show, everything. Okay. Is there anything about this case or this situation that no one's really talked about or, you know, brought up that you've thought about a million times and you just... It always kind of like f flies off after, you know, a late night of having a couple puffs or a couple beers or whatever, you know what I'm saying? But it always re-enters your mind slowly over the years. It comes back every once in a while and then it just kind of flies away. Is there anything about the case that you wish like was looked at or different or... Well, I mean, um, she's in jail, obviously. Your wife is dead. There's nothing you can do about that. And but there's probably like reconciliation. Well, we talked about the daughters earlier, right? Right. You know, is there anybody that you'd want to say something to that you wish you had the chance to have had said something to? What would you say to Pam Hupp right now, Russ, if she walked through that door and sat down in that chair right there next to us? What would you say to her face right now? Uh, that I hope she rots in hell. <laughs> How angry would you be? I would be to see her like literally physically a foot away from you. Like you could put your fist straight through her face right now if you wanted to. Well, it, it would take it'd probably all, cross your mind. It, it would, would take, take all of the restraint in the world to hold me back from doing just that. Sure. No, uh, no, I get that. I get that. I'm just saying, like, what would you say to her? What would you ask her? What would be the first thing you even say? Like, say it's a situation where you sit down with Pam. You could talk to her about anything in the world. Anything at all. What would be the first thing you ask her? Why? Well, that's what I just asked you. Why do you think right. she chose Betsy? Like, right. why? That's, like, that's what, what I would want. Why? And she would just go. Did you choose her? It was a serial killer thing. Why? I like disabled people. Why who did just, you have a vendetta against me? Somebody you met enough times to count on one hand. In any of those meetings know. with Pam, did you ever have any? Not, I'm not saying words, but like, was there ever an off vibe? No. Um like I said, I met her at work functions from State Farm, which was the insurance company they worked at, you know. Uh, she came to a surprise birthday party that I held for Betsy. And then uh, when we moved up to Troy, she came up there uh, just to pick up Betsy, you know, in and out type thing. And I was working at home um, just a few times. So we didn't have a lot of interaction. I got you. You know, so yeah. she didn't know me. She didn't know who I was or, you know, and she tried to play me off as some kind of fool. Um, I never have been any kind of fool or I don't like to think I am. Nobody does, but you know, somebody Everyone you don't in Missouri know. thinks that they're the smartest person in the room at all times. And it doesn't matter what your job is. We talked a little bit about this earlier. It doesn't matter what your job is. You always just think you're the smartest person in the room. And guys, I've been guilty of it too. I'm not always the smartest person in every room. I'm a human being. Russ is just a human being. Not to, like, give her any credit. Pam is just a human being. Betsy was just a human being. We're all just human beings trying to get it by in this world. And all we need is for each other to not be horrible to each other. That's it. Don't be horrible. The only question on the top of your head is why? Think about that, Russ. All the, everything that's happened. Everything. All the stories. Everything. Discussions you could have back and forth. The only question you want to know is Why? That's it. Yeah. Just one little three-letter word. Why? That's it. That's all you want to know. Because once you get the why, what did she turn to you and was like, I did it for the money. I wanted the money. I thought that this was the easy way to get her. I was going to get the money. How would you feel about that if she said that? Like, it wouldn't make anything better is what I'm trying to say. Like, no, it wouldn't make anything it wouldn't, better. And I don't know if it would answer the question because of it's weird how much has come out of this, right? The circus aspect oh, of yeah. what comes from this one little thing here. This turns into this huge circus with all these players that are doing all this lying and back and forth. Russ, I feel horrible for you, sir. I'm sorry. As a Missouri person to another Missouri person, I'm sorry. That this happened to you. It shouldn't have ever happened to you. That's not cool. It, it shouldn't happen to anybody. It shouldn't happen to anybody. You, you know, know, and wrongful convictions happen more than what we realize. But guess what? You're not there now. 
Nope. Where you are in reality right now is with me. We're here. And guess what? That's a good thing. Because things do change, right? They do. Bad times don't always last. But as Razor Ramon, the famous Razor Ramon, Scott Hall, who just passed away as a former pro wrestler myself. Bad guys always do. Bad times don't last, but bad guys always do. Mm -hmm. Pam Hupp's perfect, perfect example of that. Russ is bad times that don't always last because he gets out and things move forward in life. But bad guys, as Pam, they last forever. That's just who they are. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to, Russ, I want to thank you. Thank you for taking time out You're of your very day welcome. to come sit down with me and talk about these things. And we're going to get the book made into a movie. I even know the right person to call to make that book into a major blockbuster movie. We're going to get it. this done. I, no, Russ, we're going to get this done. For real. We're going to try to do this. Ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it for uh, for me and talking to Russ for you. Uh, we'll be back on the queue right after this. Welcome back to the Q. Mark Bland on 105.3 FM, 1280 AM, KYRO News Radio, 105.3 FM, KYRO. And um, we uh, just got done talking to Russ Faria about the Pam Hub situation and his wife, and that it's so heartbreaking that he had to deal with any of that. I hope you guys enjoyed that interview. Me and Russ had a very good time talking to each other. We even talked a little bit off the air after the interview was over. So really, um, really a congenial individual, and uh, what a crazy story to talk about. Like, just, just kind of blew my mind. But I want to switch gears. We got some uh, hockey coming up here in a little bit. And, uh, you know, there are people out there and uh, they have opinions. And sometimes those opinions, oh, they're unpopular. And so I want to run some of these by you guys. And I want to talk to you. This person says Girl Scouts are a creepy scam. Hmm. Girl Scouts are a creepy scam. Where do you stand on this? Do you think that Girl Scouts are a creepy scam? Now, I love the cookies. They're delicious, but I think that that's where the creepy scam comes in. It's almost like the idea of using a young, cute girl to try to play the whole pigtails. Buy a <laughs> pack of cookies from me, sir. You know, now my daughter's a Girl Scout. I understand that. Not I don't me. think of it as a creepy scam, though. Does your girl? Does your does your daughter go to Girl Scout meetings? Yeah, she's actually at a Girl Scout meeting as we speak. Okay, because my daughter went to Girl Scout camp, like a summer camp. Sure, and it was. Uh, it was layered in a way that I was surprised. Like the people running the camp, like the girls that were running the camp were like probably high teenage to twenties and they were like Norwegian or sure, like, yeah. they were like, they should be transfer were, students yeah, or whatever yeah, like that. Coming you know. from other countries. Working for the summer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Doing that. And I thought, wow, there's a whole weird thing, like a layer here with this Girl Scout camp that I had no idea. Meanwhile, my daughter had like. A great experience, but not, I wouldn't say, a great time. Because, like, she's, you know, not used to pretending to be homeless, you know, and that's basically what Girl Scout camp was. <laughs> oh, and it was like, the idea of we're right. going to sleep on this on this yeah. dirt piece of whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Even yeah, though we yeah, have yeah. campers that we yeah. can buy at any time. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, We yeah. still she have just, this. Is why, this was that. always my argument about did that for a week. people who like camping, but they only want to do it in tents still. And I sit there and I go... I like I like that. What, I but like what, but but what, right? I like glamping. I don't yeah. mind glamping. But here's my point. <laughs> my point being, we have moved on. Like if I rolled up into 1865 <laughs> on a river somewhere with like my fifth wheeler, and then I came out of it and threw like some random tent with some poles on the uh-huh. ground to the guy who's got like sheepskin <laughs> wrapped over pieces of twine, and you know he's sitting along. He's got like you know the worst pot ever to try to cook <laughs> things out of over a rock fire. Like he would look at myself and go, "Can I come in there? Right? Like can I live in there?" Please, like they would never go. Hey, thanks for bringing the fifth wheeler, but I'll take that uh, bag of uh, rocks and stuff you got there that you're going to call a tent. Like I'm cool with that. Like no, could you imagine? We moved on for a reason. Could you imagine if you could somehow do that transplant things and amenities of today back then immediately and watch their eyes? Like like you said, he's laying in dirt and you roll up and just you know air conditioned camper. 
microwave oven. <laughs> I, I just don't understand, guys. Like, what's the point of future and progressing with technology if we're going to keep going backwards going, I really need this. Am I like, do you? Yeah. Do you really need to be in the dark at 10 p.m. because you weren't able to get off work in time? Now you're at some <laughs> random campsite. You can't see nothing. You had to turn your car headlights on. Now you're trying to put up a tent that you really don't understand because you only put it up once the other day and your wife had to help you. And you weren't able like, and now you're out here with your boys who are now, uh, what? 10 deep into a 12 pack, maybe a 24 or like a case each already while they're laughing at you trying to put your tent up so that you could sleep on the ground. Right. What's that? And by the way, blow up mattress though, blow up mattress. By the way, on the second side of this, this other idea, people that are only fun when they're drunk and or high are the worst type of people. Yeah, you gotta be able to hmm. be somewhat What do you fun. think about that? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Like, I mean, I like, have a friend of mine. Like, looser or like only fun? Like, when they're not, they're completely irritable and super only annoying. Only fun. It's his only oh, well, fun. Yeah, that would be weird. Hmm. Well, no, I had a friend. Uh, his name's John, and that's all I'll say. But John uh, had social anxiety. John, well, no, he had uh, no. It's, it's no. <laughs> oh yeah, he it's had social anxiety part. disorder. Is what he always claimed. Yeah. yeah. And he loved drinking because he's like, oh, this this gets me out of my shell. And it's like, no, 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 no. You like to drink. (laughs) You like to drink. Now, he was never an alcoholic, I would say. But but then again, I think there are a lot of people that are undiagnosed alcoholics. I know a lot of people that buy a 12 pack every day of their life and they do drink it before they go to bed every night of their life. Mm -hmm. And some are functioning, some are not functioning. But at the same point, every day of their life, like if they miss a day, it's an issue for them. I don't think that that's a fun way to be a person, and I no. I do think that you're resting or relying on the alcohol to change who you are as an individual, right. specifically for that purpose. And I don't know why, because some of these friends of mine, I'll even call them and be like, "You want to hang out?" No, no, I'm fine. I'm just good. And I know what they're doing. They're just sitting there watching Netflix, drink a hammer and down a twelve <laughs> pack of beer. There's nothing fun about it for them. That's it's just fun. what they're doing. Right. And they do it every night. It's like they're filming. Me coming night. over would actually make you get out of your normal r- rigmarole and you would have to actually like be yourself. <laughs> right. I feel like that they're, that this person might be right. Maybe people that are uh, only fun when they're drunk or high, they're, they are the worst type of people. Nah. I'm, I'm sure not saying worse. like, like yeah, when yeah, we yeah, say at the, least those people are fun at some point. When we say, <laughs> there's right. people that ain't fun at any point. <laughs> drunk, high, they're no fun. Well, when we say the worst <laughs> type of people, I, I don't think that we're like, okay, let me read this to you. If you can't have a good time whilst stone cold sober and need substances to have fun, you quite literally have no personality. I often find that people who need substances to have fun are usually the most dry, boring, irritable, moody, lifeless people when they're sober. They have no character, no depth, no identity beyond the substance. This is true. We just discussed this. This idea. Meanwhile, that they, this person they writing this is probably the worst person that's never happy ever. Yeah, right. Sure. <laughs> right. I don't feel that my point needs to be explained any further. So, okay. Uh... To a certain extent, they're right. I see what they're saying. But some things are a lot more fun if Man. you're not exactly. Loose them up. Yeah, yeah, you know what Jeez. I mean? Like, a few beers makes certain yeah. things more fun. Like, playing cards with friends yeah. without alcohol might yeah. be fun, but it's not as fun. It yeah, brings a certain element. Yeah, yeah. There's a, so in that respect, Jeez. they're not right. But Take it easy. Yeah, on. like, calm down. Just relax. Hollywood's obsession with teenagers is weird. They aren't an interesting subject. They don't know anything. They don't do or say anything particularly insightful. But in movies like Licorice Pizza, or uh, they try to mythologize them, and it's always sexual, and it's always weird. Now, this individual, I know that this seems like something to blah, blah, blah. You're just looking for something to complain about. Yeah, I get that. But I will say this. We have kind of... We have kind of gone back in the last five years, movies-wise... To the older, more in-your-face style of movies, right? Like, the, there's always been this claim, oh, everything's getting so PC, everything's getting so... The- Man, you watch... Let's go into this right now. It's not Blazing Saddles, but... Hey, <laughs> who watches The Boys? Anybody watch The Boys? You yeah. ever watch The Boys, the yeah. TV show? Yeah. How do you like it? It's good. It's fantastic, ain't it? Yeah. It's got some really deep things. I haven't things. watched it lately, but... No, I'm just saying it's got some really deep things into it, right? Yeah. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I've watched Euphoria. 
Now, Euphoria is the number one show for teenagers and young people in their 20s right now on TV. It's on HBO Max, and it deals with teens in high school and college, drugs, rape, beating, uh, pedophilia. Like, it is getting really deep. And here's the funny thing. The shows are fantastic. It's very engaging, no different than The Boys, which I feel is just as deep with the things that they talk about and attack. But I see where this person might be this idea that this 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 teenage obsession's a little weird. Like these shows are really over like I say like too much. That's the problem. Um <laughs> when I was growing up, parties happened, sure. But not every party was a three K right? bash. Right. At, I was like <laughs> where everybody shows up. 120 deep right at every house so there's always 50 different things happening all at the same time to constantly create more problems in your social circles and move things forward like that's never how it was most of the time it was me and three or four other guys going what do you guys want to do well you know sarah said this and laura said that but uh you know i don't know but you guys want to go to the park and just sit on the park bench and hammer a few beers down or like it was that kind of thing it was never like yo are we going to the 120 deep party with so-and-so and and DJ DJ Flex Kid, who he's only in sophomore in high school, but man, he did some badass stuff in Miss Ballas' class the other day, so we're going to let him DJ this party, and it's by the way, the lighting setup's going to be amazing, like a nightclub. The way that this house is lit for this party, like a nightclub in New York, where you pay 30 to get in. Like, it's ridiculous. Like the, it's over the top. It's stupid. It doesn't make any sense. It's too much. The last 20 years, high school must have really changed and became super cool. Because when I was in high school, no party existed. Like, starting back with, like, American Pie. From American Pie on... High school does never, the never argument's been like the anything like that. American Pie is like the last great bastion of those movies in a time period where you could get away with screwing the pie or what, yeah, like you know, things like that, like over the topness. But that was the beginning. That's how for it's me. been for 15 years, and then around 2015, 2016, mm-hmm. now to today, we started to see like the hot dog, the the, the the movie Seth Rogen did the comedy movie with the hot dogs, and it was oh, really the sausage party. yeah, sausage party, like yeah. really edgy stuff. Like we got Euphoria type TV well, shows. We're about. getting like, into all this like really like deep. It, has high school over time changed to the level where Euphoria is is you know. Re- Reflecting high school accurately today mm-hmm. because that is not when I went to high school. Like right. you couldn't have a party like even an American Pie or Super Bad where all the people in my hometown because everyone would have gotten into a fight because mm-hmm. that's what they did back then. Nobody had fun. This person asked an interesting <laughs> question right here. They said, "How do you how 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 the f okay Ooh. do you make friends as an adult if you don't drink?" Now, here's the thing. In oh, these okay. high school shows and movies and stuff, they're drinking all the time. Like, oh, yeah. they were drinking at 18. They're drinking at 21. <laughs> right. They're drunk at 20, 25. It's like all the people are all doing, no matter what age they are, is just drinking <laughs> all the time. So how could you not make friends? Like, right. that's the question. Like, who's not able to have a beer and, and make every friends? Every drug like, who? on them. Like, I, I just don't know, man. I, I, not I, even the people that are annoying that just have fun when they're drunk and high. <laughs> right. Like, to annoy that one person. Yeah. Get that guy. Uh, this person said Facebook shouldn't put people in Facebook jail anymore. They no. should just let everything it ride. It depends on what. Whatever. I mean, they should just let everything ride. Like just everything. Misinformation. Said, everything MTG yeah. says. Everything that Bobert says. <laughs> all these idiots like Candace. All like everything they say. Just let it ride says because the, it's says the guy so that loves true. Misinformation. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Everybody else is okay with it because they're like. Uh, yeah, it's all misinformation. Yeah. Meanwhile, the guy that loves misinformation is like, why are they taking away my information? Why are they taking it away? Because it's misinformation. And this you is, love it because you're dumb. I still don't understand how Trump wasn't able to maintain harness of the people that let. Okay, so we know that Trump has sycophants. And we know that he has huge supporters, like, all over the United States. In the millions. In the millions. In the millions, for sure. 
how he wasn't able with 42 social media platform attempts <laughs> after leaving Twitter right. to not grab any of them at all for anything. Like, even this true social has been buggy and he hasn't yeah. really posted much. He doesn't even like, have an account. This right is now. what I'm trying to say, guys. Like, how do you lose that when all you got to do as a former president, go to your website, put up a blog post, yeah. put a share function there. Let it ride. Boy, Whoever has, wants to share it will share it. He has that and website, but nobody Candace, goes to it. Well, but that's my point. Tell Candace on. Tell Ben Shapiro. Get all these people that are all your friends that are all on the same page with you. Get them to, like, share it out to their fans and their people. Like, use like how could you not pull this off? Do you think he realizes that all these people are using him? The Ben no. Shapiro's, the Candace Owens, oh, they're all using him. All they have to do Guys, Candace is say Owens. something nice about him, and then he fawns all over him, and then they just move on with their own agenda. Do you guys know he the story of totally Candace Owens? Used. Do you guys know, understand the story of Candace Owens? Candace Owens, when she was in high school, claimed that racism was a part of a situation she was involved in. She, school, she uh, sued the Baltimore school district that she was going to school in, and she won on claim of racism. Cut quick change to a few years later when she's out of high school right. and the internet is the way it is. And, you know, people just take things from the internet like Tommy Lahren and all them and just make them into stars. She claimed outright during the Michael Brown situation, racism doesn't exist. <laughs> it is a made up figment in America's made. And it's like you won an actual court case <laughs> because you claimed racism was against you. And well, now, now you say exist. it doesn't exist yeah. at all. And right. It's like, it did, it did. how? It did. Because I yeah. need to get money. Yeah. Right. When I need it. money, we're now, friends. Now when I need money, it exists. Yeah. When now, I need now, money, right. we're cool. Yeah, that's on, that's everybody it. using what works for them when it works for them. Like religion. Oh, I'm so religious. And then they go yeah. do something. Ah, that's okay. <laughs> or or uh, abortion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I'm against it. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Our, my daughter's what? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, this time. Mm. We're, we're one right, time only. Exactly. <laughs> and then we're back on this. I'm so against it unless it works for me. <laughs> All right, guys. We only got a couple more minutes here left on the show. Uh, we got some hockey coming up after this. Um, have you ever quit a job on day one? Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, sort of during a training. What was your out of, I'm out of here moment? What was it? What happened? Well, I was. I always did. I worked as like uh, uh I worked uh, picking tobacco. I worked digging ditches. I worked like hard work, and I went to work for this. Ah, shoot! I forget what the name of this restaurant it was. Doesn't it doesn't matter. Chain restaurant, and I my only job was making salads. So somebody ma puts in a salad order, and it comes back, and there's a salad, and I go, doo, 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 I put together the salad. But until then, I stand there and I wait for another salad order, and I was like, <laughs> I guy? can't do this. You I can't, can't be this bring bored. myself. Are to you? Be, you were bored. Yeah, you were saying I'm just bored. like watching everybody else work, waiting on a salad. But you also, up, so I can like make a, a salad. You're one of these people. Are you one of these people that likes to be out in the field doing something if and moving I'm working, all day long? I want to be getting something done. Otherwise. I, if I'm sitting on the couch, I'll be at home. You know what I mean? I'm That's just fair. sitting there. I'm like, this is the worst ever. And I'm like, time was dragging on. I'm like, get me out of here. I don't want to make another salad. This is the one day for me. See you Jason, later. Jason, what about you? You're, you're I, uh, out I, of here day one I moment. went to a training uh, for Jiffy Lube. I, mm. thought, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll do this. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, during the training, some guy asked like something about like, well, how do you keep from getting burned up there? Because he was showing like underneath this car. And then the guy turned and he goes, trust me, you're going to get burnt. And you're gonna get burned a lot. And I was like, I was like, you're like no, I'm done. I no, I'm gonna, to have, I'm gonna have children. Me. Here's the I'm best part: go see their they teachers. could wear long sleeves and gloves and if they wanted fire, to, probably, but they yeah. just chose not to right? because just the burn is because that? of the oil filter being hot. That's what's yeah, hot. Sticking your foot in the Just pull, oh yeah, put on a sleeve like <laughs> well, it up there and just undo it and get it done. Now the guy did say that. He said, well, but he made it. This is how he said i remember to this day well we do have these sleeves you can wear oh if right. you're a nerd yeah, right like, if you, if like you at know. the high school party yeah. right if, if you're a nerd you know. all the nerds like, wear if, but if, they don't have burns if though. you're super used to skin on your arms i guess you can wear this sleeve yeah, and not right. shred it off and burn if you're into not getting burned you know what hey do you have time what do a worst job ever 
Worst, worst, worst job, job ever? ever. Uh, worst job ever I ever did. Telemarketing. There was a telemarketing job. It was just mindless drone for It was just. I bet that does. It not. just was. It was because well, you're calling people and nobody wants. It was all people. cold call. Yeah, right. it was rough. Like, nobody nobody's was talking. sitting at home going, you know what? I wish some random company. Would I don't know. Right I have now. a friend of mine. He he's <laughs> thrived in the telemarketing world and he loves can. it. And I can't. I can't cab, stab man. it. What about you? Dollar General. Dollar General, worst job ever? Dollar General is the worst job ever in the world. Why is this? Because they're like the size of one section at Walmart. Right. And they get literally the entire shipments that Walmart do, and they stick it all in their workers. I here, Here's what I did. I traveled around jo- uh, position to like place to place for places that didn't have managers. There was one district that were like 15 stores, didn't have five managers because three of them stole a deposit. <laughs> oh, oh, three about, of them. What about you, Mike? I, I agree with the telemarketing. I had a telemarketing job that was so bad one time I had to put up a red red paddle or green paddle. Green paddle if I was working, <laughs> red paddle if I was in the bathroom. They, uh, they wanted to know when I was in the bathroom. I was like, yeah, I'm out of here. All right, guys. Well, it's time for us to get out of here on the queue. I want to thank uh, Jason Call as well as Mike Guys. I want to thank Russ Faria. Uh, make sure you check out that NBC show, The Thing About Pam. Really cool. Thanks to all of those guys for being on here, as well as you can check us out at thequeenow.com T-H-E-Q-N-O-W.com Nothing to do with QAnon. Everything to do with having political discussion since 2010 on lock. That's what we do. Uh, check us out on Twitter at Mark Bland, M-A-R-K-B-L-A-N-D. And uh, if there's anything else you need out there, you can find us here every single Saturday, 1 to 3 p.m. on 105.3 FM KYRO. We will be back next week. Woo!